Ladies and gentlemen, grab your drinks and popcorn. Today's feature is about to begin. Welcome to Celluloid Codswallop. <laughs> Hello, welcome to this week's Celluloid Codswarp, and it's been a very long time since I've actually done a Celluloid Codswarp, and I'm not flying solo on this one, but I'm not flying with Gemma either. I have been lucky enough to get hold of, well, the newest member of the team, and despite what people will think, or the salty tadpoles will think, he does actually have a face, unlike the strange image that Gemma put together, bless her, but you know, she did, she did far better than I ever could in creating the arts. But I've waffled on enough to confuse you and make you wonder what on earth is going on. I'm joined by the one and only, the wonderful, the fourth member of our, tr- well, we were once a trio, we're now a wonderful quadruple quant- quintet, whatever the term I'm looking for is, Mr. James Hicks. And James, how are you doing? I'm great. And I bet you're thinking after such a long-winded introduction, what can you say apart from you're great? And I agree, that's a wonderful yeah. response. Yeah, just... <laughs> I'm here. I'm doing great. You made me watch License to Kill. Well, there are there are fates there are fates far worse than that. Absolutely, now, absolutely. You could have made me watch a George Lazenby. <laughs> well, in case you haven't guessed, we are going to be discussing License to Kill for this episode of Sailor Lake Codwalp. And for those who have listened to the previous podcasts I've done, you are, you will know I am a huge James Bond fan, which is a wonderful thing that James and I have in common. We both enjoy the, the uh, films. Now, for those who've listened previously, I have been looking uh, at the uh, interview. Uh, I have to interrupt. Oh, go on, go on. Not, not just the films. Even. That's true. That's I'll true. have you know I have read the entire collection since I, I, I was gifted it as a teenager, so I love the books as well. So I've read all the Ian Fleming novels as well as the films. So I am a true 007 fan in that sense. I stand corrected. I stand corrected. He is, a, he is probably as much as maybe even more of a fan than I am. I mean, it's going on side tangent. It was a very interesting uh, point you made that you actually have read the, the books. Because I remember talking to AJ Chowdhury, who wrote the wonderful, uh, a wonderful book about James Bond, Some Kind of Hero. And he was saying, asking me the question, he said, have you read any of this stuff other than my work? And he seemed quite impressed by the fact that I pretty much read all the books I could get my hands on. So it's nice to find there's somebody else who's done that. Uh, For those who have listened to the podcast, you will be lucky enough to know that I have interviewed people who've been involved with the Bond series, namely uh, Timothy Dalton's work. And for those who obviously know me on Bond, Timothy Dalton is my favourite Bond. Um, Unfortunately, we only have two of his films to go on, uh, to go off, but we are discussing his second entry into the series, uh, which is Licensed to Kill. And for all you Americans out there, it's spelled with two C's, not a C and an S. Um, it's not my all time favorite Bond film. I'm kind of putting that out there straight away. My all time favorite Bond film is The Living Daylights, but this was the, the toss up idea that James and I had. I can't remember, James, was this your choice to discuss this one or was it one that I kind of went with? I think it, it was a joint choice because obviously we had a situation where we weren't quite sure what to do because we needed to fill in with a podcast. So I suggested something that we both would not really need a huge reminder about. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, why don't we, why don't we pick a Bond film? And then you said, license to kill all the living daylights which took me a while to work out because you told me in initials. <laughs> so I'm like, what the hell is LTK? And I'm, yeah. pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we don't have The Dark Knight Lives no. as a Bond film. <laughs> and, then it's, and then it struck me as to which ones we were talking about. Mm. So, License to Kill is an interesting entry into the series because mm. it was, at the time, quite a departure of the style of film. But to just give the, the, the sort of the balls an idea, a bit of history on it. So it was the second Bond film that was made by Timothy Dalton. It was a 1989 entry into the series. Uh, it's first it's as old film, as I am. Well, it's, it's, it's younger I than am. I am. 
<laughs> but it's the uh, it's the first Bond film that had a fifteen uh, yes. rating, and it it was quite a departure, wasn't it, for the series because mm. it, it went into a very into a, a violent manner um, with its story. I mean, all Bond films have a level of violence, but this was taken to a point that was markedly the, different than anything we'd had I, before. Absolutely, I th- I tend to find that with License to Kill especially if you do watch it in sequence so you know you're just off the living daylights you tend to find that the the murders and the deaths scenes seem to be more personal and one thing i did notice is it's a it's a huge departure from the bond uh, formula in that for once this is just for james mm-hmm. this is not for the safety of the world this is just James is angry and wants revenge. Mm-hmm. And rightly so. You know, uh, just, uh, we'll get into the plot later. But as I have to say, it's very divisive in that it treads new ground. So like all new, you know, all films that decide to shift their position slightly, you're going to like it or you're going to hate it. Now, I like it from a story writing point of view. I like the fact that they tried something different with the same characters. And I did like how they actually worked around things and, you know, tried to keep a Bond film. But I also like that they tried something different. Again, it's not my favourite. I mean, mine is actually the follow up, which is GoldenEye. GoldenEye is my Bond film. But it was it was it's it's an entertaining watch. And again, I'd say it feels more like book Bond. I don't know about you, James. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, just uh, going on a side note, when you mentioned Goldeneye, Goldeneye is actually the first Bond film I ever got to see in a cinema, so it was, uh, ah. that was quite a quite a, a special one for me. And it's the one that I probably had the most real knowledge of as I was getting, you know, as I became more aware of Bond films. Mm. I got to experience the whole process of the Bond film coming out, because I'd obviously been too young for, for the other the other films, certainly Dalton's and most definitely Moore's and was even live some of the ones before but um yeah it's it definitely has that feel of of uh, of the, the the bond of the novel which is certainly one of the main things they say about dalton he is sort of fleming's bond he's, he's he take you know you can imagine he's walked off the page and it also takes every bond film to a degree takes something from the the, the novel that it was either based on or it, it takes something from them and in this case it took from um Live and let die for elements of the plot mm. and from the Hil- from the Hildebrand rarity as well. Yes, the plot. Uh, it might even go into property of a lady with a part of it, but he certainly lifted from those two. But we're getting ahead of ourselves for those who are listening. So to give an idea of the plot, um, this uh, sees Bond pretty much just being Bond. He's not, as you said, he's not on any kind of mission for this. It opens seeing him with his friend Felix Leiter uh, attending his wedding. Um, and Sharky. Don't forget Sharky. And Sharky, yeah. Yeah, don't forget Sharky. But the other interesting thing is that up until this point, it was the only time we saw an actor playing Leiter returning to the role, which was yes. David Hedison, who'd first played the part in Live and Let Die with Roger Moore. And obviously, you'd look at it and think, well, you know, there's an age discrepancy between him and Bond, but there's always an age discrepancy of some sort with the characters this i think happened because it adds to what happens within the story that it's a recognized face it's someone you can go aha this is somebody who yes we actually can link rather than having the previous people who is always changing every single time now i you could argue as well it could also be the fact that um obviously the agent element is that's mm-hmm. why the recast there is no felix leiter Felix Leiter is a pseudonym. It is a code name. Again, much like the idea floated for Bond himself until Skyfall was there's no such person as James Bond. That's why his face changes all the time. It's just a name. So, But it was nice to have that continuity because especially when it comes down to Q and Moneypenny, for example, you know, those are two very regular occurring characters. So it's nice to add someone outside of mi6 as a as a returning character but yeah i love i love the opening with it being obviously everyone's kitting up for felix's wedding so james bond in a three-piece suit with tails 
which looks like it. Which on uh, if you look at the uh, the suits of James Bond website where the Mad Spacer uh, runs, he makes the comment that it's obviously clearly a rental. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> it's I would not love the most see, elegant. I would love to see the conversation afterwards. Uh, excuse me, sir. Why does this smell of gunpowder? Don't ask. Why is there a hole in your hat? <laughs> I did think that. I did think that was hilarious. How it was just the the opening scene is obviously uh, Felix, Sharky, and Bond in the in the wedding car being stopped on the freeway by the U.S. Coast Guard. Via helicopter, mm-hmm. and linked to the DEA. <laughs> yeah, because it, yeah, it's like we have we have all we have all the um, we have all the the government agencies involved. We have the CIA with Felix, the <laughs> DEA, and the Coast Guard, which again makes sense because again the the main villain of this is a drug runner mm-hmm. who is played fantastically by. Is it Robert Davy? Yes, Robert, Robert Davy. Yeah. He is absolutely fantastic. He is a absolutely fantastic character actor. I I loved him in this. I loved him in The Goonies, and I loved him in Stargate Atlantis, which is another sci-fi reference, which is always well. The, in, the interesting thing you hit on hit upon with this actually, when you mentioned the other agents is in it. Um, it's right at the start of the film. You have a mention of the fact that the tracking. Um, well, to give a bit more history to the story. So where this film really kind of became different, and you, you hit on it really early on than previous Bonds, is it isn't some maniac trying to take over the world. It's not some guy with trying to, you know, control Silicon Valley like in... Say, There's no Blofeld. Yeah. There's no... Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to think... I'm thinking... Um, Live and let die, uh, Zol. Oh, yeah. no, Mr. Big sort of thing. You're yeah, there's, the, yeah, there's no, there's no blow felt. There's no, um, there's just no big baddie who just wants the world. This is just literally one, one Cuban who's got a mini sub operation essentially. Hmm. Because it's, it all, it's all realism. set. Yeah. It's all set in like the Florida Keys and that surrounding area. It's, it, it's such a microcosm. Mm. As well, it's then, another step away that is unique to any of the other Bond films in that technically Bond doesn't even return to the UK at any point. That's which true. Again, um, it's very true. And it's a level of realism to it, I guess, because mm. it's a drug runner. It's a drug dealer. So when the film opens, you've got the you, you see the situation of um, uh, where it, uh, it kind of ties into the fact that you're saying about all these agencies. Uh Robert Davies' character, Fran Sanchez, has obviously his girlfriend, Lupi, played by Talisa Softa, has cheated on him. Mm. I can say from, from a standpoint, that's not a smart move in any shape or form because <sighs> he goes uh, with his gang, gets the boyfriend, uh, makes the comment of, you know, what did he promise you, his heart? You know, basically give her his heart, and his guys go out to take the guy's heart out. <laughs> Fun fact. And, uh, Fun mm-hmm. fact as well. Is lead henchman a very, very young Benicio del Toro? Ah, oh, very true. Yeah, that's I'd forgotten that. And yeah, and yeah, he's yeah, it, 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 such a, he's such a, he, even in his young baby faced years, he's just as menacing as he is now. Mm. I, I got such Sicario vibes from him. Mm. Like he is, he's perfect for that kind of role where it's soft spoken, but absolutely terrifying. And gen- a genuine threat, despite youth and you know you wouldn't think it. He does it brilliantly. And where, but also where you see this kind of level, something you didn't see in the Bond films before, and this is within that opening scene is that that level of violence. You know, this guy has his heart cut out. You know, Sanchez whips his mm. girlfriend with a, uh, a like a, I think it's from. Uh, like a stingray's tail whip sort of thing he's got, and it's quite a brutal thing. You would not have seen that. No, and then and it's, you see. Go on, sorry. No, I was just going to say as well. It's the fact that he brings it with him. It's not like mm. he. It's not like he takes off his belt or he picks up the nearest object to strike her. It's the fact that he appears. To, this is a regular th- occurrence, mm. and it turns out it is. 
it within is, the yeah. you know she, it turns out Lupe's character often runs away and he just tracks her down and her punishment is to take the lashings mm. and it is it is the fact that they yes it's a close up on the on Lupe's face on Sanchez's face but it feels such so much more visceral in that it's just the two of them in the room and she barely makes a noise mm. uh, which again is it's that we it's laying that groundwork of Sanchez this is a normal this is atypical behavior for him I mean you're right on the the word the, you know she she you know cause he even says to another word before he starts hitting her but here's one for you let's see if we we can test your knowledge on bond so you mentioned the fact that all these agencies are involved when they're tracking his plane no one's going to the keys and they're, they're, whose voice do we hear for extra points you know there are no points because you know what do points mean well in this case bugger on but i like to test <laughs> points mean prizes yeah <laughs> oh um oh, da, 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 oh, oh i feel like it's on the, it's it's on the tip of my tongue but it's it I can't. I'm stumbling oh, over it. It's all right. I'll end the punishment. So you know, we just you know we something like it's like we might if we we hurry up, we might be able to just nab the bastard. The king of cameos. It's Michael G. Wilson's voice. Ah, because I believe he's un- he's uncredited as well. It's quite possible he's uncredited, but I definitely know it, it was him who who did the cameo. But as you said, so moving along, so. They're they're tra- they're tracking him. They find him. They get they they go by helicopter, you know. Well, Bond, the DEA, uh, and lighter. Uh, they leave poor old Sharky to basically carry the cannon. And explain why he <laughs> will not be at his wedding. That yeah, go Sharky down has well. to explain to yeah. a bride. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. We got kidnapped by the Coast Guard. Well, I say we them too. And Bond is along as an observer. I like that. again <laughs> just the idea of. Here's a sidearm, which, again, it's very strange seeing Bond wielding something that isn't a Walther PPK. But, again, it's just being told, no, no, you're an observer, sit in the helicopter. Because, mm-hmm. again, it, again, another point that the film likes to point out is this isn't Bond's court. This isn't Bond's expert area of expertise, nor is it his permission because again, everyone tries to make that clear to Bond. This isn't. This is nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. You know, this is not an MI6 job. It just so happens that on the day of my wedding, where you are invited, it's now or never mm-hmm. to wrap up this drug yeah, deal. Yeah, that's true. So it's nice that it's a case of, you know, Bond is almost on a back seat for this. Yet we still get to see him do some wonderful, wonderful stunts. It's also interesting to uh, a point that I observed watching the film is that one of the D agents who's played by Grandel Bush, which links in also with Robert Darby, because they're both in uh, Die Hard together playing uh, yes. FBI agents. <laughs> yes, because um, Davy was the Vietnam veteran who calls it calls in halfway through and nearly cocked everything up yeah so what did you make of the pre-title sequence which is uh, i'll let, actually see i'm letting the salty tabbles into a secret i've seen some of james's notes so i want i i i, I have looked to them he he made comments upon this and i want to i have i kind of had a quick look at them so i'll have the surprise of knowing what he you know, well, I, I also didn't. Fresh. I didn't show you the other five and a half pages. I ended up. That's writing. what I like. So, what so. did you think of this? Because I rather mix. There's elements of this pre-title sequence I love, but there's a very specific element of it too with planes and yes. fishing. Yes. Yes. And yes. I'm always a bit yes. unsure what to make of that one. No, I agreed. Um, I agree with you. The basically, uh, Davy manages to escape in a Cessna small little uh, two-seater plane. So Bond and Felix jump aboard the U.S. Coast Guard helicopter, and Bond decides to use the what I would call the personnel winch to lower himself onto Davy's plane, but rather than t- 
take the controls or anything like that. He pulls a Christopher Nolan 20 years early. Because I did know I I got huge Dark Knight vibes, uh, not Dark Knight. Um, the which which one's the third Batman the of the Nolan verse? Dark Knight Rises uh, vibes, yes. vibes definitely there, and you can see. I mean, Nolan is a huge Bond fan, mm. and he said that it, it it reflects upon elements of his film. But yeah, the as you were saying that it's this moment where to me it lacks the I don't know the urgency and the kind of umph of some of the pre other pre-title sequences that bond is lowered to wrap a chord as you said it's like the personnel movement thing uh mm. around the plane to take the weight of it and yeah it's kind of cool but i don't I know i don't i don't believe it like it does it does take me out of it in the sense of the the plane's thin aluminium and i can all i can envision is again much like in Nolan's film, where the plane disintegrates essentially from the forces, it would do the same. However, again, it's it's a little jarring to begin yeah. with, but it it still feels like Bond because yes. again, yes. it's no worse than any other opening stunt. You could go through all of the stunts in James Bond and talk about the the physical limitations yeah. again speaking of the living daylights one of my favorites is bond cutting a larder off at the chassis <laughs> with the laser yeah. hubs mm-hmm. and not hacking off two russian police officers ankles that's true which again should have happened but we do uh, we do, i do, i think uh, there is there, there is that element of i i can suspend my disbelief for some things and when we're talking a big set piece, it's one of those of I still like it. I still think it's a it's a novel way of doing it. But I think a better plan would have been Bon fighting Sanchez and having him pulled out of the plane with the winch so that he is again he's still fishing. So it looks like he's the bait swinging around unconscious underneath because Bond already has a parachute on. So I would have also worked if it had just been. He opens the door, grabs Davy, throws him out, and unbeknownst to to us as the audience, he's actually clipped his belt or something. So he's hanging upside down from the winch, and then Bond just bails and lets the plane go. And then Felix jumps out afterwards, because they both parachute to the wedding, which I think that was a... <laughs> it was a... I was like, well, that's a stroke of luck, isn't it? Just this... Just to uh, be yeah. over it, yeah. Yeah, just to be over, and yet no one looks up into the sky and points when there's a helicopter towing a plane. But when two <laughs> men in two men in rental tuxes come down on parachutes in the middle of town. Well, it's it's also I do find it amusing that Felix's wife, Della, when her father's saying to her, I told you this was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Of interest. So obviously they parachute down, they get to the wedding. Um, we get Gladys Knight's uh, theme song, License to Kill, which mm. I quite i i didn't mind it it's not a it's grown I, on me yeah it's it's very 80s mm-hmm. very power ballad but i think when you when you compare it to like diamonds are forever mm-hmm. it's kind of got that vibe eventually but i think it's it, it is one that grows on you it's a change in the whole kind of soundtrack because it was michael Kamen who did this soundtrack and really pride that with Main, other than a few old changes, uh, mm. you know, seldom few, generally always been John Barry's kind of bag. So this is mm. quite a departure in the style. And interestingly, originally, for the actual just the James Bond theme, which is kind of a bit different in this one as well, I believe they, they got Eric Clapton to play it originally, a version of it, which you can, which for many years wasn't even available. You can now find it online on YouTube. Very different style. So yeah, this was a big shift. We pass in. We pass from that in terms of. Thankfully, Felix's wedding has gone ahead. He's now happily married to Della. Everyone's partying at his house. We get a, a, an interesting. Felix is still working. He's off at his office working, and we yes. get see our first our first sign of the Bond girl to be, which is uh, the lovely the one Pam. In, yes, Pam. Pam, uh, Pam Boucher. I <laughs> Bouvier, uh, well, uh, Bouvier, Bouvier, yes, which Bouvier, leads, to a, a, leads to an amusing thing later on with the name swap. But um, yes. it's also this is like the last one we ever see Bond smoking cigarettes, which is openly, uh, yes, yes, yeah. 
because um, obviously Dalton himself was a smoker and he brought back that uh, that root that uh, little yeah uh, handle of bonds back from back from the Connery days as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you also notice the uh, the Chekhov's gun moment? Oh, tell me, go on. Uh, the lighter. Ah, what the the gift lighter? The very specific gift lighter, you know, James Love Forever from mm-hmm. Delia oh, and yes. Felix. Yep. And I'm like, hmm, that's going to come into question somewhere <laughs> now, isn't it? Well, they also the the sad reality of that is that. It, it it has a very very overactive uh, lighting mechanism, but the That's... problem we now face with things like Blu-ray and 4Ks, you can see the little uh, <laughs> tube running. <laughs> yes, running down his sleeve that will yeah. re- fed the down extra pro- sleeve. propane. Yeah. Again, I have to admit though, speaking of effect wise and upscaling, it seemed to do quite well. Yeah, oh, I, God, I, yeah. I noticed that a couple of a couple of the special effects still hold up really nicely. And some of it, I do think is down to the way that they were shot. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a, there's a death scene and the way that it was shot really helped mm-hmm. with the, the aging of the effect. But as I say, we'll get onto that afterwards, but yes, we have the, we have the lovely, um, we have the lovely after, after the, after the wedding moments, where everyone is getting um Tanked. having a nice <laughs> yes essentially <laughs> then unfortunately uh Felix Felix gets found as it were yeah cuz it cuts interestingly that um Sanchez is known to be somebody who pays people off to get out of jail mm mm and we, um, he obviously, you know, saying like, you'll have to remind me of the actor's name who's, uh, plays Killifer, but he, I know Everett from, McGill. Yeah, Twin Peaks. Twin guy. Peaks. He was also, um, I remember him from one of his, um, <laughs> from one of his not as great films. Uh, if I remember correctly, and I'm just going to double check this because I don't want to look like an idiot. I'm almost certain he was in Under Siege 2. And yes, yes he was. You're right. <laughs> he is, he was the, <laughs> he was the lead henchman to, um, to, uh, the villain in that. And I, I just remember there's a very famous scene where, uh, Steven Seagal's daughter, uh, sprays him in the face with pepper spray. And he just takes it off, or opens his mouth, and puts it in his mouth and sprays it. Like that's his, a real uh, man there. <laughs> no different than hot sauce or something like that. And, but yeah, he was also in the original Dune. Ah, which he was a uh, very yeah. Dilgar in Dune. So again, uh, again, another fantastic character actor who you know him when you see him, but you can never quite remember what from. But the things that he is in, he does leave a good impression. And Killiff is really seen as being the good, like the real buddy of uh, Felix. But, mm. you know, as one would always say, foreshadowing. Because, <laughs> again, and you are, the point you made earlier is so spot on Florida. Florida really, is, I mean, you see him going through the Florida Keys are going to this big bridge because, uh, you know, um, yeah, Sanchez is San- being he's being Sanchez being, being transferred. Yeah. yeah, and he's in the back of the van with Killifer because initially Killifer makes a huge point about that's you know this is your money does your your money's no good here and yeah, yeah. scumbag drug money <laughs> and then Sca- and Sanchez is just like green is green no matter where it is you know he's like mm-hmm. uh, and it you know two million even in. 1989 money, that's a good chunk of change. He actually doubles it, doesn't he? He offers, he goes, instead of the million dollar bribe, he'll do two. Yeah. And then obviously we find out mid-transfer that he's actually accepted it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Killiford strikes the other guard with his shotgun, which Mm -hmm. then forces the van off the bridge into the sea. 
where and I'm still trying to I'm I had to I had to rewatch it a few times and I'm still not quite sure how that got arranged. Who knows? I mean, can I, I can only think it's to do with one of the characters we see uh, later on. It's some arrangement with Crest, who's one of um, Sanchez's people. But yeah, that 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 all goes ahead because they're rescued by some mariners and they go off where they need to, yeah. wherever they're going to go to. And there's an and the point in the film here is I love it, love this scene because it's a real nod back to 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 Bond as a person, which is where. He's leaving, and Della and uh, Felix are there, and she is she basically is going to throw her garter to him, saying that you know, yes, he catches the next one to get yes. married, and he he doesn't want it. He's just going, no, I'm going to go, and she ends up throwing it to him anyway. He catches it, and she's trying to work out what she's what done wrong. And Felix did... is saying, you know, he was married once, but it was a long yeah. time ago. Yeah, and the, it, again, Dalton. I've, I've made this in my notes. Dalton uh, nails that quiet emotion mm. of you can see the pain in his eyes. Mm-hmm. So you immediately know he's it, it, that's exactly what he's thinking. Oh, God, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, my memory's going back to that day. My wife was killed, mm-hmm. you know, but again, he doesn't let it show through other than his eyes. And he's, I think he does a really good job. But again, unfortunately, this is all in hindsight. Yeah, so I can also so understand how this can be so jarring for people. And it's just like, mm-hmm. why is Timothy Dalton staring at me through a screen? <laughs> and it's mm. like, no, no, no. He's, he's trying to, you know, and he, I think he does. I think he does actually do a good job of it. I mean, I think you, uh, you, again, we're kind of going all over the place, but it is the point you made that, the problem I think Dalton had is he was. I always I've said this previously discussing him that probably I think he's too good for the role. He's too good an actor, and he's giving you what Bond would probably like as close to reality rather than the action man that people probably may be expected a one yeah. at the time. Well, I noticed again and again. I know we will get back to the plot, but the quips weren't there. He yeah. only makes like two mm-hmm. in the entire film. Yes. Yeah. All the quips are given to other characters. Mm. They have the funnier lines. As it's it were. Fair, I, pr- I prefer. I don't want Bond being like a walking quip bag. <laughs> I don't mind it when he does it to himself. I don't like it when he does it in front of other people. Yeah, like the Roger Ball school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like that's where that's that's where i feel austin powers nailed that. oh god yeah well that that's the whole because, thing with austin powers it gets it yeah. perfectly where it's just quip 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 <laughs> and it takes the other actor to go yeah that's enough and he goes yeah okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> agreed <laughs> it's like yeah we, we should get moving austin right oh yeah but the film then again, and the, the point I, I really, the really hits home with this film is it's that tonal shift. So this, the henchmen are at Felix's house. They, they, mm. you know, cold cock him with a pistol. And then you can see they're going to do unmentionable, horrible things to Della. And then Felix is there. You wait, you know, the scene cuts to him. He's coming out of consciousness, unconsciousness, and he's at a warehouse with Sanchez with Dario, with a multitude of other people, with Cress there, who's it, the guy who runs it, underwater. The but stuff. it is nice, it's nice that it's not very clear as to where they are. Yes. As yes. well. Like, there's no obvious signs that this is an aquarium, as it were. Though, you know, that this is something to do with fisheries until the slab of meat comes out and the floor opens up. Yeah, and this, if you were watching Bond, if you took yourself back and imagine you've watched Roger Moore's stuff, you've seen the fantastical things, you know, even looking at Dalton's previous one, it's, mm. it, it was, you know, a bit of trying to take over the world. Well, even that was getting a bit more realistic, some kind of drug stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But it wasn't like this. Can you imagine watching this without any real knowledge of the cinema and you're going, what the, <laughs> oh my yeah. God, what is going to happen now? Well, I also like the idea of, um, as you, almost the opposite of like, in the sense of remember Kananga with being in, being inflated over a pit of crocodiles. <laughs> Again, 
absolutely ludicrous, but I liked how they managed to package almost the same elements using a wild animal as a as a you know as a weapon and made it feel like it was even possible. Mm -hmm. The idea that you know yes the floor opened up and we're above a a great white shark yeah it's a it's my the Florida Keys it's Miami they have sharks mm -hmm. it all feels like I have no doubt everyone from everyone who was fl from Florida watching it was like oh that's nothing that's a baby that's a tiny one <laughs> but the fact that as you say to anyone else you'd be like oh my god he's and got a shark it, yeah and it's quite a thing to watch because Lighter is, is there, and he, he basically, you know, he knows what's going to happen. He's seen it unfold. He's his killer for, so he knows well, he's been double crossed as well. He's not quite sure because, as I mentioned before, the slab of meat, which looked like half a cow, that you can almost see a slight confusion. Like, why is that there? Well, surely you right because they all surely you wouldn't want to feed yeah. the shark if you're going to feed it me hmm. so it's almost like felix is like this is definitely not going to be a standard situation this is not going to just be torture and then murder this is going to be something horrific and in turn it becomes it where the meat is used as a counterweight to hmm. felix so the shark begins feasting on the meat and as it does, Felix lowers into the water. And the fact that, again, Sanchez, he's probably looking for information, doesn't need it. Mm. This is purely to be horrific to Felix. Well, as he says to him, it's nothing personal, it's just business. Yeah, but, it's, but you've got to remember, even from a plot point, his henchmen are still back at Felix's home, and as we discover later through Bond, they they've searched the whole house. They took all his file. They take all his files. They take all his documents. So when you learn that, you can look back on it and realize, yeah, that's just sadistic. Mm -hmm. It's not like he's gonna yeah. pull him pull him back out once because obviously Felix loses a leg, and he almost loses his arm because the shark eats the meat, lowers him in, certain chomping on felix and then and felix is recovered it, well it's quite a graphic scene as well because you see felix yes in being eaten you know he sees he's lost limbs and then it cuts yeah. to cuts to bond because bond's going to undertake his next mission goes to the airport and he's trying to okay, what's yes. going on and he says to the lady at the first class desk what's going on she's like oh drug dealer escaped he's like oh crap yes runs out uh, one thing that did upset me about that is um, all of Bond's flights are usually booked under Commander. Ah, but well, you think he'd be under a, because, a, 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 no, a fake name, but no, because it gives him clearance. Because he's travelling to a, 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 it's only a pseudonym if it needs to go on into a non-allied territory. But Bond's mission is in Istanbul. Yes, which at the time I believe was still allied. But yeah, so he, it, yeah, yeah, you're right. Because you, well, I mean, you might just make it a slip. It's just missing it, him. Yeah, I think it's 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 a very very minor thing, but I do I do like it when people call him Commander Bond because it it's a reminder of he's not just a spy; he is a serviceman as well. Yeah, he's, he's carries out out. carries carries a rank in the navy. But he he obviously hot foots it over to um, Felix's house, and mm. you know, no response goes in armed. And this is kind of the beauty of. Dalton in the acting, you see real sorrow because he finds the dead body of Della, who's been raped and murdered by the the, the henchman. You can kind shot. you can kind of see as well they really had to tone it down because I actually thought she should be in a lot worse state than she yes. should. Yeah. So you can clearly tell, like even even when they were making it, they knew they were pushing it. And a lot of the behind the scenes, you know, echoes that sentiment of this was nearly an 18 because of the nature of the way that, you know, the way that they were trying to portray the story of being very realistic. It also, I mean, it was very gruesome. And it's interesting when he does find 
Felix, we obviously understand he assumes he's dead on the um, dumped on the sofa in the office with the you know uh, in a body note. bag. Yeah, with this That's note. That's the creepy this, uh, bit yeah. as well. It, it's the fact that they obviously again as Bond walks in, you see the office has been turned over, papers are uh, all over the place, and there is a body bag on the sofa. And as you say, initially Bond opens it up, sees Felix, finds the note, which again. I'm getting, di- I get diehard vibes from it. He disagrees well, in- with something that ate him. <laughs> well, the interesting thing when he walks in is also you see Bond looking visibly upset. It's not the, yes. you know, the unhuman action star. Now, the note, the other, I mean, the other, the elements of him, him, him losing limbs and him being eaten by a shark and the note are all from the novel of Live and Let Die. It's, it's mm. all lifted mm. from that. Um, but yeah, somehow, and Lord only knows how Felix is alive. <laughs> mm. That I was a little surprised at, given given the way that some of the other characters are tre- treated later in the film. I'm very surprised that Felix was the one to survive. Mm. But it was yeah, and it, again you see the look on his face uh, when Bond realizes, and he, you know, trying to desperately call for an ambulance and things like that, and trying to get his head around everything and you can you can just kind of see him start going off the rails at this point yeah you know when you he's see how, well like when he screws the note up you can see again this is what i love about don you see the you know there's not put too fine a point on it he's pissed okay he's oh absolutely. Ra- absolutely it's the rage levels he does it's like that scene in living daylights after saunders is killed don't get yes. a very good line in rage mm. I, and as i said it's that it's that being re- he does he does a man reaching the end of his reaching his limit he does that very well in that you can see that twig snap in his mind yes. like behind his eyes you can see it's like oh yeah here we go and the chainsaw comment as well which leads <laughs> oh, them on I always to the, found that yeah I always found that a really kind of strange comment with the policeman's like huh you can bet it's like some kind of drug thing, chainsaws, with a bit of a quip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I, I understand it, and it, it's a it's a nice little nod to Scarface. The idea of yeah, it's this is this is what the drug this is what the drug dealing world is like in Florida. Uh, you know, chainsaw attacks are apparently you know ten a penny. So. But it was it's the fact that Sharky, uh, who we later find out through conversation, charters boats for a living. Mm-hmm. Therefore, he knows the Bay Areas. He knows it's a shark bite. That's what leads them on to the 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 initial um, the initial kind of um, plan of attack, as it were. So we need to find out where our shark where where can we find sharks? Where are we likely to be able to? find a shark and they find crests aquarium which Mm -hmm. interestingly something that i i picked up when i was watching it but didn't it never really played on was he mentions genetically altered fish yes he does about the line about making them fatter i mean i like also the fact there are there are changes to males so that they can gain weight faster and i found that interesting because i thought hmm again why mention it if it's not used hmm. because surely that would draw more attention to your operation, which is technically a cover. So why yeah. would you do something so radical, which could then <laughs> see you thrust into the limelight? Well, at that time also, the, the when mentioning cover bonds cover is pretty good. She uses the old universal export, which is yes. MI6 is forever, you know, cover for just about everything. Um, when he goes to, when he goes in, but it's also the little nods that seem bomb being observant because he sees the, what would be like the, the, the lapel flower, doesn't yes. it? Yes. That yes, shows it would have, that makes him realize the that that's where it all went down. Yeah. yeah. He sees the buttonhole, and that is his immediate trigger of, I don't care what they're saying, this place, this is the place. Now we need to find out why it was here, you know, what happened here. Which, you know, cues the, um, cues the, uh, the first visit uh, uh, during the night. Also, he notices the submarine 
the mini sub. Yes. yes. Which again, in the plot line, Crest claims that he no longer hunts sharks, and yet the sub is called Shark Hunter Two. Mm-hmm. Because he, he makes he tries to make it a, a thing to sell it, doesn't he? To uh, yeah, yeah. The bond. Which I thought was a nice, uh, a nice, you know, uh, thinking on his feet shows that Crest is definitely involved because he's he's very quick to come up with a cover. In that, yeah, I don't need you to use it anymore. You want to buy it? Because imagine if Bond had said yes. <laughs> yeah, go on. I'll make you an offer. Yeah, how much <laughs> you offer it? it to the roof of the car outside. But that's what I mean. It could have it could have blown the whole thing out of the water. Because he, he, Crest knows he needs it, but it shows that he's trying to think of a cover quickly. So it's not. It's nice to know. Yeah, they, w- our characters are on the right track, obviously, but. Again, it's that observational thing of it's showing that Bond is picking up on the details. And as you say, he finds the corsage on the floor, finds the buttonhole, sorry. So he immediately knows, I need to look into this further. And then obviously we begin the night raid, which is um, does have one of the weaker special effects in it. The, the shark head. The rubber shark head, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very, very much reminds me of Bruce from Jaws. It's Bruce's smaller, weaker cousin. Little Bruce. Yeah, there's, there's a, it's a, it's a really, it, it's. I don't know whether it's played for laughs or whether it is meant to be a jump scare. But Bond steps on a grate as they're infiltrating this aquarium and they're going in from the water rather than from the um, from the pavement side. So as he steps on this grate, a shark head just lifts him up, mm. and um, it terrifies Sharky. That's it. It just turns off. So like, yeah, it's a, it's an it, okay. Yeah, it is. I mean, the the action scenes when it cuts to inside the, uh, the actual you know building, I always thought it's pretty good. You know, you see, um, Bond having to take out the security guys who are in there, and he flicks one into a uh, into a. Well, he's tra- he, he's he's initially trying to find what's in this drawer that's full of maggots that clearly are probably pasta. Yeah, that was that was that was one thing for me was again the effect that they tried to use was clearly inflating and deflating some sort of bag under mm. this pile of jellied worms. <laughs> but then they zoom in to Timothy Dalton digging through and none of them are moving. They might be wiggling slightly but only once he's moved them but yeah, he discovers the cocaine and Again, unusual for Bond. He gets um, he gets caught from behind by a security guard, mm-hmm. uh, who then takes a handful of maggots to the face, followed by some very large Timothy Dalton fists, and then gets thrown <laughs> in the, in the drawer with the maggots. And he does he does have a little quip on that oh, one. Bon you appetit, remember? Yeah, the bon yeah. appetit. Bon yeah. appetit. Which I I kind of again it's. The guard's unconscious. He's on his own. I allow it. That's my rule. I'm okay with that. And then, obviously, second guard makes his appearance. Yeah, and he gets... The way that he's dealt with it, I always thought it was really interesting because he's basically pulled it by a hook into yes. a, uh, a tank of eels, electric eels. And there's uh, nothing said about it. It's just... No. It's done dusted. There's no shocking comments. See what I did there? Well, there'd be there'd be some kind of you know come like electrifying if it was Roger Moore or something like that. That's what I mean. Nature. It's like you know, I bet that was a bit of a shock to him. Yeah, or it'd be like a Sean Connery shocking line. Yeah, um, but I mean, obviously, then Bond finally sees Killifer, who is about mm. to execute him, and again, it's only pure luck by Sharky popping up and knocking through when he a, does. a ground hatch and knocking him over. That prevents him from being killed because he's going to feed Bond to the shark. Yes, Killifer, Killifer ca- catches Bond after Bond dispatches the second guard, gets him to stand on the trap door, not knowing he stood on the same. I think it's the same hatch that Bond came through, which is Probably, why Sharky's yeah. under it. Because again, rolling back slightly, Sharky is clearly staying behind after Bond goes in. So the fact that Sharky is now 
gathered up the courage to go past little Bruce and open it. It's very, it is, it's a lot of luck. It works. And it's nice that it's nice that they got that gets deal, dealt with. Well, I particularly like the, the way Bond deals with Killifer, which is where he's saying, well, I'll split the money with you. Uh, and he keep just his takes old, them, yeah. keep his old buddy. You yeah. keep it, old buddy, and just throws this suitcase at yeah. him. You weren't it, you keep it and throws it at him. And the yeah. the reflective instinct to grab it is what is Kilfers and doing because he gets uh, he lets go of the chain but, he's hanging yeah. from and ends up worse than Felix. Yeah, shark which, food. But it's it's also the the great response of um, you know shark shark is, yeah. what a terrible waste. And Bond look Bond looks at him kind of askance and he's saying like, money. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's like, how dare you? And I'm like, no, no, the cash. And then we have probably one of my favourite scenes, which is the 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 follow up to the aftermath of that, where mm-hmm. Bond and Sharky are planning their next step, and I can't remember if it's another DEA agent. It's Grandel Bush's character. Uh, yeah, the D, one of the DEA guys. Yeah, I because I, I, I always got confused as to whether it was CIA or DEA. But yeah, Grand El Bush um escort um escorts Bond to Hemingway House and there he meets up with M. But I'll bet the other I, I will take a guess on a comment you made earlier. What you really like is how he refers to him correctly by his title. Yes. Yes. Partly because again I do I, I like it's that I. It's just that I don't know what it is. It just makes it feel, again, makes it feel more realistic. In that, mm. yeah, it, a, a spy would have some form of rank. Well, he is know. a commander, and it's the fact that he references him. She goes, "This is where it ends, Commander." Yes. Before he leads him into Hemingway's he, house. He explains about I can only cover up so much. Yeah. I can only cover yeah. you for you for so much. Again, reinforcing the idea of this is not Bond's purpose bond's purpose is for much grander things yeah because the reality you know, is that it should be being you know the way it'd be looked at is that the american you know law enforcement should deal with this one leave it to them it's yeah. their problem it's their country it's their laws it's one of their citizens who's been it's uh, solely domestic killed out and the other one's been hurt leave it to it but yeah. when it goes to hemingway house i remember as a because you see all the Ernest Hemingway cats that were the yes. cats that live in the house, the weird toes, one the six-toed around. cats. Yeah, I remember as a kid seeing this when I was far too young and thinking, "Hey, oh, cats, cats, guys, they're stroking cats. Could it be Blofeld?" And then yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, no, Bond dropped him down a chimney. <laughs> Stainless steel. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be a real yeah. bond there to understand that comment. I know, I know, I know. Oh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so obviously Bond gets reprimanded by M. You know, you were supposed to be in Istanbul last night. What yeah. happened? And M trying to remind him, you know, you're you're letting your emotions go through. This is leave it to the, you know, as you said, leave it to the locals. Felix I, I is alive. Feel- I always feel very sorry for Robert Brown in this situation, watching this scene, because everybody, even like you can see Tim Dalton sweating, everybody else is sweating. Oh, and he's in the he's full... He's wearing a three-piece suit. Yeah. <laughs> it must it's have been like, horrendous. I like to imagine that ju- just out of shot, he's got his trousers rolled up to his <laughs> knees and he's stood in a bucket of water. You're assuming he's wearing trousers. I'd hope they'd like wear shorts. <laughs> That would be even better. Bermuda shorts and three-piece suit up from from the waist up. He must have been boiling. Yeah, well, I, I can prove, sadly, that he was wearing trousers because when Timothy Dalton jumps over the railing mm. after trying to fight the other double-O agents, you see him stood. So you do see that he is, unfortunately, wearing trousers. So, yes, I do agree. And I have... I do find that very strange that they were willing to kill Bond. Or at least the other agents were, but M wasn't. Because well, we see the sniper in the bell tower take yeah. a shot. And then M is like, no, there's too many people. 
Well, it's... No, to, um, to, it's your best to, agent. Yeah. Jumping ahead, I mean, obviously what happens is he's given the ultimatum bond. He's saying, look, it's, he, he you know, as we, you know, to par- you know, not verbatim, but he's kind of saying, basically, Felix knew the risks. It's let, let the Americans sort it out yes, and clear yeah, up their yeah. mess. And you see, to bond, it's obviously, it's not just his friend. It's the personal thing of seeing his friend's wife being killed, which will be a, which will obviously bring out memories of him. And he, you know, says that on his wife. Mm. He tells him not to be, you know, so be so sentimental. sentimental rubbish, yes. basically. Um, now, this is, again, a, I just think wonderful acting from Dalton. You see, you know, the range of anger and other emotions. But when he put, you can see him kind of basically he's thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what, I'm going to have to do this. And he resigns. Now, the strange thing is, this is the first time, other than saying on most of secret service, when he sort of resigned, but didn't. This is the first time we ever seen really resign. But later on in like other films, Bond seemed to resign at the drop of a hat, left, right and center. Um, but yeah, he somehow managed, he manages to escape and go on the run, and as he said, the <laughs> M won't let him be shot. And again, I'm sure you love this. You know, says God help you, Commander, as he as he runs off. I, th- I think it's just it's like I could understand if it was bring him bring him like listen, Bond. I I would like a bit. Of, I, I would have liked a bit more clarification in, in the sense of listen, Bond. You can either resign. And you're sworn to the Secrecy Act, which again, nice touch. Well, of, yeah, and um, also I'm um, going, you know, you're, you're still under the Secrecy Act. You say anything, we'll kill you. I have to say, I forgot to mention, I absolutely love his response to when Bond resigns. You know, this is not a country club 007. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, you can't just hand in your membership, yeah. sir. <laughs> Yeah, the country club line was a good one, and that, but as I say, I just it's the whole thing of shooting at Bond. I can I can understand understand it in the sense of the the double O agents probably thinking, oh God, he's going to kill him. You know, yeah. the, uh, well, the sniper is probably is thinking right. If Bond is fighting now, there's a chance M could lose his life. Well, it's also the fact that you've got to think he's kind of assaulted him. He barges at him. So really, I can see why they probably would take a shot because yeah. attack, it's a you know protection point. Yeah, yeah, because as you say, is he going to lunge at M? But I just, it's this idea of he is your best agent. Maybe give him a week off rather than just it's a, it's your job or nothing. I know, but he, to be fair, he's been but, on a plane for God knows how many hours. It's hot. He's probably just cranky. <laughs> <laughs> God damn so, it, man. <laughs> yeah. God damn it, Bond. Just shut up and come. Well, I think Go it's home. kind of mentioned, there's a comment on it in the novelization of it, where he's sort of saying, this is why I to spend so many hours sort of thing getting here. <laughs> he's, he's not yeah. happy about the flight. I think I think it was the idea of M knew he had to talk him down. Yes. Yeah. And the, the only way it was even going to remotely work was, I have to do this and I have to do it face to face. A phone call's not going to work. He's just going to hang up. But if he sees that I am here, to bring him home, as it were, it will have more of an effect mm. than sending someone else or, you know, calling someone out or anything like that. So, And then we get yeah. that, that shift, don't we, to Bond. He thinks he's going to be able to find um, Sanchez. Excuse me, Sanchez, he's, he's on the boat, the wave crest. Yes. He, he goes he, back to he goes back to tracking down um, Crest from uh, from the aquarium because he knows mm-hmm. that's his strongest lead. So him and Sharky go out. Although I do love Sharky. I think it, Sharky's utilization in that was a bit off for me. But again, I'll let it slide. You get the scene of um, Crest being a dirty, dirty boy spying on lupe and it's also it's also the interesting way of how bond gets the boat because he's under like a fake manta ray uh, yes because could it set off all the security and they do that was a manta ray and sets off the sonar it, and then the yeah. probe the boat has it's a brought back probe. in yeah it looks like um, a mini it, sub but it's a it's a remote controlled probe that, and it's the way that bond Basically, he has to obviously incapacitate a few people, gets through, and then he goes into the cabin, which is where Lupe is, where Crest has been perving on there. 
And again, it's a very cold, hard scene. So he basically says, you know, grabs her by the hair, covers her mouth and says, make a sound and you're dead. Because he's got a knife to her throat. That was what I was about to say as well. It's not like it's a suppressed pistol like we used to. Because mm-hmm. that's Bond's normal MO. Mm-hmm. This is much more personal in that he's got a essentially a diving knife. Because that's all he can get. Because... He he'd not got any of his his equipment, so it's a lot more, uh, as you say, it's a lot more thuggish. Mm-hmm. It shakes off that image, but I do love as well. Um, I call him henchman number four. I don't know what his actual name is, but I just call him henchman number four, who is uh, taken out first, and you see the first mention of the um, decompression chamber. Mm-hmm. Which is aboard yeah, the boat, which, which, which for our play a part tadpole, later on. Well, for the tadpoles at home, not only does it play a part later on in the plot, but it's also it's significant in, in the sense of for divers, it's uh, decompression to stop decompression sickness or the bends mm-hmm. When, mm-hmm. when they come up too quickly. So it's nice that there is they've not shoehorned it in. This is a this is a boat which has divers on board, therefore it will have a decompression chamber. The fact that it then they also use it as a money store because Bond finds the bundles. Mm. And again, the bundles play on later. In fact, um, in the action sequence, just after this scene. But I also like the fact that um, Lupe, uh, he comments on Lupe's uh, marks. Mm. The scars, yeah. On the scars on her back, and I just find it it's it's nice that he is still trying to be the good guy, and yet it's the hypo- it's the hypocrisy mm. of him saying, "Well, I'll gut you like a fish, but I'm upset that Lupe sm- uh, Lupe has been smacked by Sanchez." Mm. You know, it's, Again, it's, it's like putting aside the putting aside the fact that Bond himself is a psychopath. Again, yeah. And has has done probably worse to others, mm. and will do worse in later in later iterations. But it's it's interesting, is it? Because he obviously you know gets Lupe again holding her at knife point though to because Crest is saying what's going on. She's going, I know nothing. I've been asleep. You know, go away, did it. But then we get yeah. that scene where we see Sharky has been killed, and it's yes. uh, quite. It shows how messed up the people are who've killed him because they're, they're treated as a joke and again we they're see the laughing real, the, the rage the cold rage that don't does so well where he basically is going you know well the, the line you know you've got to find yourself a new lover um yeah and then um it's the fact that sharky is hung strung up yeah. next to other sharks shows yes. that the absolute contempt and lack of humanity so when he when he when he kills the diver with the harpoon gun, and, well, it's, uh, the that, it's the way that it's the way that it's the way the diver's going. Oh, guess what? His name was Sharky and laughing. Yes, yes. He, you overhear that passing comment of his name really was Sharky, or something similar to that. So Bond harpooning him, saying courtesy of Sharky, and it's quite a cool action sequence, isn't it? Because it's underwater, and then you have. The, obviously, I don't know who the stunt double was, but you know, war scheme behind the the plane that he's because he he harpooned well, it to get onto it. I was actually going to say as well. One of the things I love about that fight scene is the added element of the oxygen tanks. It has been done before. Oh yes, yes. Spy Who Loved Me has done it as well. But the idea of the man that Bond first kills, he takes his scuba gear, and whilst he's trying to. Um, hide from the other divers you see him check his regulator and see that he's running out of oxygen so he's got to be careful and then he gets in a fight and ends up having his airline cut anyway but uses the distraction to grab onto the probe which we then discover is full of cocaine that's true and yeah. this is yeah. how so this is how um this is how the product is moved. This is how he, he uncovers the fact that they're using what they're calling ocean, uh, oceanic um, mapping or 
you know, searching for wildlife. They're actually using it to rendezvous with a pontoon plane where the drugs and the money are exchanged. So the money's put back into the probe, the probe returns, and then the, the product goes off to the cartels. And mm-hmm. as you say, Bond harpoons onto it. We get the barefoot water skiing, which is, again, another wonderful stunt. And then I've got in my notes, it's um, Bond turns into um, Bond meets Twilight Zone. As he looks like, <laughs> the little, looks like the little gremlin crawling around the plane, trying to get into it. And he does the wonderful um, climbs in the opposite door. Yep. And then Which kicks. I think somebody would notice, but, you know. Yeah, again, small it plane. is a Bond film. Small plane, but yeah, he does kick him out. And then we discover that um, apparently uh, money is bulletproof. <laughs> Depends how much you've got. Yeah, I mean, I have to admit, those cubes are quite large. So, but yeah, Bond defeats the pilot by hitting him in the face with what looks like a square foot cube of money, which, as, a, as mentioned, takes two bullets first and then hits him with it. Um, and then he throws the pilot out, which as well, which is a nice touch because they actually go to recover him, which I thought was very odd. Well, the probe just going to, you know, find out what the hell went on, then get rid of him. But it's uh, yeah. it's interesting. I would, I would have thought they just let him drown. It's but it's interesting, isn't it? Because Bond is basically I, I can't remember if does he then off the top of my head is it that where he's looking in the computer to find out yeah because he's got to find yes. out where he can fu- so he goes through a list of agents who are pretty much all dead uh contacts yeah he, and find he goes to the informants list so yes. what happens is bond does bond takes the money from the pontoon boat because the deal never went through uh during the the fight scene previously bond stabs all the cocaine yes, so it, does, it, yeah. it goes into the sea that's why they suddenly surface so the deal never actually goes through but bond takes the money that's in the back of the plane obviously hides that somewhere safe and then returns to felix's house hops the fence to avoid the police goes into his office finds the photo of um della finds finds her photograph, finds the hidden disc, and as you say, puts it in the computer, we find out, um, he finds the informant's list, and he gets the name of the sole surviving informant, and he finds out there was a meeting due to be arranged. And, again, scrolling back through the film, we actually meet this informant at the wedding. Mm. Bond actually gets a glimpse of her, during the wedding where she's passing some information to Felix. I also and, love uh, the fact that that in that scene, we see the wonders and we've seen it already earlier on of a giant D, uh, CD writer drive of the time. The mighty five twelve megabytes. <laughs> and it's a gold disc. What, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing what you, and dot matrix display. Hey, gotta <laughs> love that <laughs> top matrix. It's like, it's like it's like aliens in the future. Everything's been run on DOS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it again, technology aside, we discover yes. we discover the identity of the informant and Bond makes his way via cigar boat. Um again, I can only assume that's Felix's. Or I don't know. I think it's probably one he just bought with the money. Because he's well, no. that He's, you don't think so, because he's flinging that money around like no one's business when he hands the guy not, and put it in stern. Not until... I uh, see, I don't I don't think it is, because I think it's... He does pay... He does tip him well, which is a, which is a well, point, he, but he I would think... He kisses the money, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, because he's like... Good. Yeah, so it's possible, but... So we meet at the... Uh, what I... What I, <laughs> what I put in my notes as the titty bar... With two exclamation marks. <laughs> See, yeah, I agree. It's a strange. It's I not just a bar. It. Yeah, I don't mind it's it, a... but it's like someone said. It turns, you know, he obviously meets her, you know, meets Pam there, and you know, they talk about guns. She's packing a proper gun, not not a wall. Yes, that was that was shotgun. funny. <laughs> She's like, "Are you armed?" Opens how's his jacket? But, you know, how do you get a shotgun into a bar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where was she hiding it? Because it's not like she she was wearing leather trousers and mm. a leather vest. 
Like you, I'm sorry, but you need at least a trench coat to hide a sawn off. It's a pump action shotgun, but and <laughs> it's just such such the the uh, measuring contest when it's like I've got a 38 Walther, I've got a 12 gauge. I think I'll be doing the yeah. fighting. And then, she and then of course, hit the deck, doesn't she? So, <laughs> well, she does, and then she has, um, uh, as I've got again in my notes, it says the goon squad assembles because as they're talking, they they realise that they're being set up. James and Pam are discussing further actions and what they're going to do. The goon squad um, of Sanchez's henchmen come into the come into the bar. And again, we get a fantastic scene with Benicio del Toro. He comes and sits down at the table with Pam and Bond. Pam immediately points a shotgun in his ghoulies, which I think most of us can agree is not a not a nice not the nicest way to 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 meet someone. And then we get into probably what is the the worst thing any firearms enthusiast wants to see on television, which is a negligent discharge. Pam is knocked in her seat to the point where she blows a hole through the table instead of Benicio del Toro. The point you were saying about, you know, the the, the shotgun, I mean, it's a kind of a way, I don't mind the scene, but I don't love it because Bond in a bar fight, bit different, but believable, I guess, so. Uh, well, certainly the way it starts in the fact that it goes from a disagreement at a table to an all out brawl with everyone. And that I do I... love the music in it. I didn't used to do, but Dirty Love, I think, is an absolutely brilliant song. Yeah. And I'll plug them. Cue the music. Who do Bond, who perform Bond music, do an amazing rendition of it. And uh, again, I'm going to plug a previous episode. I interviewed Warren Ringham, who is the. The creator of cue the music on this so uh you know on the podcast i do so get um i did i did like the music i did like the fact that it immediately stopped well it didn't <laughs> yeah. it didn't oh. immediately stop <laughs> it's almost but nothing happens pam just <laughs> turns pam blows a giant <laughs> hole in the wall perfectly round yes perfectly round and human sized from 12 gauge <laughs> buckshot which immediately stops everyone fighting because it's like the up it's the upage of the guns weren't in mm. play until the negligent discharge when she blew through the table that started the whole fight. So it is that nice thing of yeah okay guns have come out now it's a bit more serious. So and then they so they make their escape. We have I also mentioned the uh, the swordfish. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a bit. It was a bit Roger Moore that one when a guy picks a, I think I don't even think it's a taxidermy swordfish. It looks like it's just fiberglass. True. I mean, you do so always get to see that look of shock on Bond's face, like. What? Well, yeah, when it comes through the chair that he's got, up, he's holding up a chair like a like a lion tamer, and a swordfish comes through it. But obviously, they make their escape in Bond's cigar boat. Um, <laughs> Leaking get- cigar boat. <laughs> Yes, he's leaking cigar boat. Uh, Pam gets, as I say, Pam gets shot in the back, uh, which we later discover, which we discover is a um, bulletproof vest. Which I do, I like Bond's reaction to that as well, in that you can kind of tell he doesn't actually care about her. He cares about the fact that his informant's dead, yes. or he, he yes. at least believes that. So when when it turns out. He, you know, when it, when it turns out she's a, she's okay, and she comments on, "Isn't Kevlar wonderful?" And you can see the relief on his face. You can tell it's not relief that the fact she's alive; it's the fact that he's he is still going to get his information. Yeah, and it's it's that you know, there's a realism because he, he reprimands her. He, does he swear at her? Yeah, because he goes, um, "Are you lucky to be alive?" Yes, yes. I, that's something that again. The language is a huge jump. Yes. Uh, yes. You, you notice, you start noticing a lot more. Um, you know, Carrie, uh, Carrie Lowell, who plays Pam, she's she screams out bullshit to Q's face yes. later on. Yes. Which 
you can, you know, I'm like, how dare you speak to Desmond Llewellyn like that? How dare you? But it's 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 an interesting scene because as you kind of mentioned, you know, Bond's totally on his own because when he's saying to her, I want to get mm. Sanchez, and she's going, well, who've you got? And he goes, well, me and you. And she's like, you're nuts. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to have a whole army to take him on. No, it's fine. It's just me. And then uh, I, I I got in my notes, it's like, um, it's early um, woman go raw moment where she's like, I'm ex army. I've flown in some of the yeah. worst places ever. And it's, and he's just like, and yeah, I've, he, I've saved, I've saved the world millions of times. It's fine. Well, when they run out of fuel and she's like mocking going, you know, yeah. been out for a long time, run out of gas and the drifting and, you know, the 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 they hit upon a deal for the amount of money she's going to have and the kiss. It's interesting. So I remember listening to an interview with Carol Llewellyn. She was saying that she'd wanted to kind of be tougher with it, kissing him. Yeah. Um, but he thought... wanted it more gentle because she reckons he she would have been a tougher character with him. But oh, she would have made the move on him. Yeah, yeah. Which I can believe if you think about her character. Yeah, and because uh, again, it's the you, the juxtaposition of the two conversations. It goes from berating each other to kissing because they've agreed to be paid. And being a Bond film, they've got to get the romance moving. Yeah, which, again, uh, and the interesting touch is the fact that technically we have two Bond girls in this one. Yes, yes. This is so true. that is, that is, I just found it, I found it, I found it a bit, a bit jarring, this idea of you pay for the fuel. You find the plane. <laughs> like they're still drifting out in the middle of the sea in a in a cigar boat that won't move. But yeah, it's fine. Just have a snog while you're at it. It's fine. I wonder how long it took them to get to shore. <laughs> I don't know. And uh, when she sits on the horn. Oh yeah, carry, we're in carry on bond. That could be Roger Moore style Terry. That was definitely. Although again, also kind of reminds me of uh, Zach Schneider. Watchman. Oh God, yeah, and yeah, oh, you know, I've never ever thought of that, but that's true. Yeah, I wonder if he did. Yeah, it yeah. is the superhero kind of um, stereotype of. Hmm. Well, now we know what's happening because the flamethrower went off. Symbolism. <laughs> now we've got the now we've got the horn going off. We know what's going to happen now. But yeah, this I, I I put in my notes: sexy negotiations. <laughs> on a boat with no fuel. But then we we cut to like Isma City, which is Sanchez's heart of his operations, where he lives. No, and, we don't. Um, don't we? No, not oh, immediately. Go on. You missed. On. You missed the stock footage because interesting fact <laughs> about this film: none of it was filmed in the UK. It was the first Bond film not to be it's filmed true. in the UK due to a. They slashed the budget of this mm-hmm. film compared to the last, and they genuinely couldn't afford it. So there's stock footage of jolly old England. We get to see some red buses going up and down. That's how you know it's stock footage. <laughs> and it's just a quick jump back to MI6, and it's mm-hmm. Money Penny because Money Pen- mm-hmm. Money Penny plays a very important role in this film. And this scene explains it all in that Money Penny actually informs Q. Because M and Money Penny have a chat, because Money Penny informs M that Bond has still not left the United States. M kind of glosses over it, and Money Penny is like, "Well, I thought you'd like to know that he's still. Uh, we don't. We haven't heard from him." And obviously, this is because Money Penny is she. You know, she loves Bond. They have a very unique relationship, but. She truly cares for him, so she calls Q, and then it cuts back to, um, then it cuts back to, um, oh, what's the what's the town called? Ismus, Ismus City. Ismus, yeah, See, Ismus I, City. Cuba, I, I not off to, Cuba. Yeah, I have to slap myself for for not remembering this because he is, yeah, you get a tearful money penny um, ringing to speak to Q Branch to to try and get some help for Bond, but because she knows is, that. Q is the only one who would. Yeah, the, I think he's the, the only one who can do that without, you know, like getting told off, kind of the thing. The craziness of this scene, or the total craziness, is you would think, okay, well, you know, where was this shot? It's one little scene. So I, I remember 
speaking to Caroline Bliss, and she was saying that they flew them out to Mexico to film this. Mm. This one small scene. And I remember asking her, I said, well, did was anything missing? Did you film more? Was anything cut? And she went, yeah. She was saying that most of her friends had said, Caroline, what was there more to do? And no, that was it. <laughs> she yeah. was that. It was literally that scene just to just to just to have it done. And I really wish they'd given her more. I think she deserved more than just that one scene. I I agree, but I I also understand why there was a lack of her because again, mm. it's not an MI6 story. Mm. So the idea that she would have minimal involvement does kind of make sense. Mm-hmm. And it is it's quite sad because I believe it's the last time Caroline yeah. actually it, it is. played the role on on screen. So again, it is sad that the the last performance was a, essentially a bit part. But hey, they flew her out first class to Mexico, so you know. Exactly. <laughs> could be it worse. Could have been, it could have been worse. She could have ended up in China. <laughs> Which is where I think they'd once considered filming. <laughs> yes. They were they the, uh, they accepted an invitation from the government of China because um later on the Hong Kong uh drug department get involved with the storyline mm. and there were going to be scenes filmed on the great wall of china as well as the emperor's tomb with the yeah. terracotta soldiers and i believe it is due to the budget cuts that they had to basically annex all of that and mexico was just cheaper plus it does fit more with the i i i think if it had been, if it become more globe trotting, then it's more like a Bond film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's you. You'd have to argue the logistics. You know, Bond's got no gear. He's got no backup. How's he going to get around the world? And it's also one of the things when people take it, they complain a bit about the wardrobe in this for Bond. He's on a limited wardrobe. If you think about it, he's basically been on holiday. And then all he's got is the gear that they had on holiday with him. So he's yeah. on a very limited amount of stuff that he'd actually have. It's real. That's a level of realism I like. You know, they go to Yeah. That. Uh, but it cuts the scene where they're in the hotel, don't they? And like, yes. You know, he's uh, flashing the cash around that he's using Sanchez's money and yeah. rather cruelly reprimands. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Kennedy. Yeah. Ken- Ms. Kennedy for her clothing, making out she's his secretary. Which cuts nice to the fact when he goes basically get yourself some nice clothes, etc., and explains why oh, she the does. wig she's wearing, the wig she's wearing yes. is uh, we see her real hair later on because Bond has to make a deposit of all the cash and he finds out he's, he, the best place to go is the the, the bank owned by Sanchez. Uh, well, well, I think I, I think that's more of a it's more of a it's a wink and a nod to the audience of I'm going to make a deposit and just so mm. happen to be. Um. It just so happens to be the same bank, but it yeah. kind of it kind of makes sense because again, Bond gets a lay of the land and he gets to um, he gets to see the fact that um, Sanchez and what appears to be a uh, group of Triad members mm. are discussing the operations of the bank, and that's again, it's a nice element of how they introduce the third almost antagonist being the Hong Kong department of the police Mm -hmm. who are also trying to get Sanchez because this leads to a massive cock up in a few scenes, which we will discuss when we get there. But yeah, we see Sanchez upstairs in the casino watching the televent televangelist. And I thought that (laughs) was absolutely, uh, it was such a brilliantly written uh, cover story. The idea being that the goal that the televangelist wants to raise is the price of the kilos of coke and the amount that donations come in from different cities. So Chicago, a church in Chicago donates $500, which we then find out is code for 500 kilos at what again, we discover that the 22,000 is the new price per kilo. I really thought that was such a wonderful way of covering those kind of, you know it's it was the such the brazen nature of being so open about it yet having such a interesting code method 
I really like that as a way of getting around things. I'd agree. Bless your heart. <laughs> yes, bless <laughs> your heart. <laughs> um, but it, it, I, it, it's, it is cool that seeing yeah. that whole the whole set of people, you know, Sanchez has all these people, and then we cut to uh, Bond and you know Pam going into the uh, the casino where he's, he's, he's betting. The ugliest casino chips. Very true. Uh, within this they scene, they also they also hideous. have a real. They've always had a go at Dalton over his hairstyle in this, where he combs all his hair back. Yeah, because he's got I mean, a widow's peak. Yeah, but he can't it's, help. He's, he's no, got receding no. hairline. It is what it but is. But it, it is very much a. It looks. It's. It's very Nicolas Cage. Yes, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of think the reason they change it, it's not the worst hairstyle they could have, but I think the reason they've. They do it's probably because the idea is he's maybe trying to change his appearance a bit and I don't know, slick back hair fashion of the time maybe. Possibly. It could also be the fact of it's it's all he could do. I mean, going back to the climate thing, it could literally be mm-hmm. it's just the humidity. Mm-hmm. No matter what they tried to do to make work, nothing looked right on camera other than just slick it all back. But he Keeps did. It. Yeah, I mean, I like it, the scene how he's gambling and he's up a load of money, and <laughs> one of the guys calls him a jerk off. <laughs> yeah, and he's just like this. This British jerk off wants to raise the limits, and it's just like I do. And again, I like the introduction of Lupe. Yes. Um, yes. the one thing I found interesting was they've got cameras for the tables, but not microphones. Yeah, because he sends Pam off to make it, to get him a drink, to, you know, so he can get him a shaken <laughs> up third, and she's not happy. But no, she so she calls the barman a wanker in sign language. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, and well, he, he understands then. Doesn't shaken, make, but, not, stirred. not stirred. But yeah, your point is because he, because you know, Lupe basically says, "I used to work here." And he said, well, what I'll lose? And she goes, yeah, we'll take a bit, but not a lot. You know, sort of thing. Take some of his money. And he manages to walk away to another table because he's going, I better quit for the night. Goes to another table uh, or somewhere else. And he's talking to her saying, I've got to see Sancho. And you're right. How has nobody else picked up on this? But it's the fact that he's very forceful with her. He's pulling her around by the elbow in the casino. It's not like he's just like she slipped him a key card with some of the chips. And like this will get you in the this will get you in the elevator. It is a genuine ragging around the casino, going, "You listen mm. here, you let yeah, you, but, you show you show me where he is right now. Yeah, Take me." But again, Bond's the, the craziness that is Bond that he will he, you know we this isn't about a mission. This is like a complete personal thing for him. Mm. He's yeah, he's he, he's got no cover to keep really. No. So I do. Well, he's pretty. He's, he's pr- I, I guess maybe he feels he's got nothing to lose, or he's willing to lose everything. Yeah, yeah. To achieve the the end goal, but yeah, when he when he um, when they go upstairs, he meets Sanchez. He's walking around the office. You get the um, you get the uh, the close up of the bulletproof glass mm-hmm. when he's when he's commenting on the view. I also like the way he introduces himself. It's not yeah. like they're trying to do the, you know, the whole thing, building up the tension of Bond, James Bond that they do in a lot of films. It's a realistic, he puts his hand out, you know, yeah. to introduce himself. And I also like the fact of he's, I do like the fact he's, he's he manages to keep calm. It's not well, just, yeah. it's not just, I'm in the office, I'm going to blow his brains out and mm. shoot my way back out of the office kind of thing. Which uh, he probably he, couldn't do anyway because they disarmed him. <laughs> Take well, his gun from him. That, it's true. It is true. They do disarm him. And annoyingly, they keep it. Yes. yes. Which I, I, I actually, I think that's a good, it's a good, it's a good idea. It's a, it's a nice little nod to the fact that Sanchez isn't as dumb as people want to believe. Hmm. Like, he's being cautious. You don't need a gun, senor. You know. We're in a safe city, you know. I, I thought know. that was na- that was nice. As I'm going to keep your passport, I'm going to keep your firearm. <laughs> yeah. Until but I he's know. Funny. Yeah, because he's looking into him of who he is, but it's also the way he's um, they're talking about why he's there. And he's saying, "You know, I'm temporarily unemployed. I want a job." And he's yes. saying, "He's got a 
you've got to show a a, um, a skill that nobody else yes. has. He said that will be too difficult. You know, really dissing the guys who are. <laughs> who yeah. Oh no, he's he's like it wouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. And then eyes up the bodyguards is like I'll take all of you out. Bring you who know will piss who understand will piss. Yeah. Off. Yeah. Um, I also like af- after this scene. Um, as I say, I like that Sanchez doesn't quite take the bait immediately. Mm-hmm. And we get a glorious cameo from Kari Hiroyuki Kagwa, who is the um, Hong Kong drug department. He's also mm-hmm. um, the original villain in Mortal Kombat. That's Your true. soul is mine. But I also, I mean, going back to the scene of, you know, Bond and Sanchez across the desk, I like the fact that he's talked about his work and he described himself not as a problem solver, but more of a problem, problem eliminator. eliminator. And there's yeah. that knowing laugh of the two lunatics, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of just like... Battle yeah. the nasty bastards, basically. They know laughing. the code, yeah. yeah. He uses that code well. But yeah, just um, I like the, the introduction of the... Um, the, the introduction of the um, the you see start seeing the triad and then we have probably my favorite my one of my other favorite scenes in the film which is um, Bond goes back to the hotel with Pam and the uh, receptionist informs him that he he has a visit from his uncle <laughs> which leads to an absolutely fantastic introduction of Q with Timothy Dalton I, barging well, yeah. Prior to that, though, I love the way in the um, the lift how he says, "You know, let's make it let's make it a proper family unit. Give me your gun." Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's just he, a great line. Yeah, yeah, you're only saying that because Pam then pulls off the lower half of her skirt. I couldn't possibly comment, but what I do yeah, also yeah. like is the fact that um, he's given a Beretta, yes. which is the proper, is the original yes. gun Bond had. Uh, uh, Beretta Cougar, I believe. Taken off him. Yeah, until he's not, taken I'm, off him. Yeah, until he's taken off him. Yeah, because again, in the beginning, he says it always gets snagged on the holster in the in mm-hmm. Doctor No. Yes. So yeah, that's a nice nice little nod for when he when he's re-equipped for that one. And yeah, it's just Desmond Llewellyn getting knocked on his backside <laughs> over a chair, <laughs> and it's it's Bond's absolute genuine concern. <laughs> I could have bloody killed you. <laughs> How very true, yeah. It's and it's a, the the reality of showing that you know Bond would be dead without assistance from Q Branch because he's saying you'd be dead long ago. And he's given him all. He's given him gadgets that he can use. Yes, um, his, his travel gadgets, as I called it, because he just he just opens the suitcase and is like, right, what do you need? Here's an exploding alarm clock. Here's some explosive exploding toothpaste and a weird camera. A weird and a camera gun that only f- uh, only fires to your fires palm a... print. Well, and also the weird camera that has a laser built in. <laughs> laser <laughs> and X-ray reason. function. Yeah, why? <laughs> well, one, Q. Two, I noticed as well, I think there's a missing joke in that scene. Go on. Well, you notice that when Pam looks at the photograph, mm-hmm. um, Q and Bond are skeletal because it's an X-ray. Yes. But the the painting is also showing up. <laughs> and I, I was thinking that, but yeah. And I was thinking, is that was that going to be a joke of there's actually someone spying on them from inside the wall, mm. and the laser in the flash took them out. That would have been God. That would have been good. That would have been very because good. Because they do that later in Dine of the Day. Mm. When Bond is in Hong Kong in the hotel room, he throws a tumbler through the mirror mm-hmm. and it shatters and you see all the Hong Kong officers behind with the cameras. So I think that would, I don't know whether it's a missing joke or it had to be cut because they still use that. Whole scene. Or maybe you've just cut the scene just you should have put it. in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, again, they still use that hotel room. So I think it's one of those things of it could have been done. But I think the fact that they return there, you wouldn't do that if you then discovered there's a rotting corpse with a laser 
with a laser wound to his forehead behind the picture of the room you know, would be a, a bit stinky. Tape. You'd think so. And I do, I do. I love the line where it's like, we're all going to go to bed. I hope you don't snork you. I mean, yeah. And I like the fact that when Bond has basically been equipped and he's going off to the casino to, to, uh, to, to basically prepare to kill Sanchez, he, cause he has to, you know, he has to get on the roof and whatnot. We see Bond appearing as Bond would generally appear at certain things where they, he pretends to be a waiter. And, uh, yes. I was just, <laughs> yeah. <yep. laughs> I like I, I I like the fact that it's um yeah Bond the bellboy to get up on t- uh, he he uses his bellboy cover to get on get onto the roof he then equips his uh, abseiling cummerbund which again which was another pretty, which again it's a pretty cool little thing to have it kind of makes sense that there'll be something in the cummerbund and he when he's on the roof because he's obviously had to put um put toothpaste doesn't he the dentinite he does he puts he puts yeah he puts the puts the toothpaste explosive around the the window frame and annoyingly they show him use a really cool gadget and i mean i knew cigarettes could kill but bonds are even worse ah the lark cigarettes yeah yeah cigarettes nice bit of sponsorship there well, it makes it doesn't make wonder whether it, is, it was merchandising because none of the cigarettes are actually featured. Because in the mm. in the in the plot, his box of cigarettes is actually a remote detonator. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he plants that, and at the same time, we hear the triad discussing deals with Sanchez, and ex- they arrange the compound visit. You also get that signature John uh, Glenn thing of a, a startled animal creating a problem. Yes, that pigeon. Bond nearly I, gets caught by a pigeon. But I do particularly like the scene when it comes to Bond, where he's a, he's putting the signature gun together from a you know it's designed to like a, a, a high you know I guess a, a high tech camera, and uh, he's all lined up to shoot him. And he gets the shock of seeing, because he goes to another room and sees um, Kennedy Bond. and um, oh, it's Kennedy Heller. and Heller. Heller, Heller the yeah, head of and security. Yeah, and he's he's a bit taken aback, but he still goes for the shot. I have to admit as well. Did you notice something weird about the um, the shooting? Go on. The the window falls out in a single piece. <laughs> it's true. And I think the reason behind that, because again, for the tadpoles who are still managing to listen through us, <laughs> you will listen, you know, tadpoles. You will listen. Keep going. Stay to the end. Come on, we're almost prove, there. We're almost there. Yeah. But, prove prove Gemma wrong. Yeah. But as I said, um, the weirdest thing is, I think that was because again. The building that they were using, they couldn't blow a window out. Mm-hmm. I can believe. I that, think that's yeah. actually a doorway that they put this fake frame into, and had to use as little explosive as possible. Because I think you can actually see the whole framed window just kind of fall back into the office to open it up. We also get some brilliant Philips sponsorship, who were sponsoring a lot of the Bond films at this point with this little gadget where yes. he's a, but he uses to blow the window, but he also have him swearing again, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a bit unusual with what the found, birdie bastard. I also found it weird. Um, I find it weird that his uh, trigger mechanism had a radar on it for some reason. That's true. I can only assume it's maybe meant to be, you know, it's part of whatever it's meant to be, but it's interesting that also you get that, the cut scene where you're seeing the influence Sanchez has, where he's talking to the mayor. Yes. You no, know, the president, sorry. And he's El Presidente, saying, only, and it's like, why is your check so light? light? Yeah, you're only president for life. <laughs> yeah, and he, he said your payment was a little lighter. And it's like, yes, you didn't make a lot of fuss when I was in prison. So well, be the, grateful. The president, the president is also played by the son of the man who played, was it Kerim Bay or something in in a, from Russia with love 
Mm. I can't remember, I remember myself. But it's uh yeah, and then obviously Bond falls foul of ninjas. Got yes, ninjas. of course. Got yes. ninjas in an eighties film. Action. It's ninjas. the eighties. Has to be ninjas. <laughs> and I again, I actually like the fact that Bond gets his ass handed to oh, him. Oh, he does. He gets it handed. And it's to him, bloody. He? Yes. I, yeah. He, he gets a nasty gash to the head, and then he wakes up tied to a table. Up to this point, I'd always question how hurt. I mean, you see it with Craig certainly, but would you ever see Bond this much, you know, this badly hurt in films? Probably no, not. Not up until then. Bond always seemed to escape, at least cleanly. Yeah, he was quite Teflon. <laughs> Pretty much in the sense of, you know, he'd just brush it off. And like no one would ever, be, no, Bond would never have to cut, like his villains wouldn't get the upper hand. Mm. He would be distracted. You know, he'd get cornered and disarmed. And then something that he'd set up late for, uh, previously would bear fruit. And so on like, the early actors, on the early actors, their hair pieces remained remarkably in place. <laughs> well, again, yeah, I think it was a case of rugs flying everywhere would not look. <laughs> the, the budget would have exploded just on lost wigs. Well, it was like the joke once on an episode of, uh, I think it was a big train with Bond, that he's going to the, Bond's going to the Bongo. You can do anything you can with a man half my age, apart from run your hands through my hair. <laughs> But yeah, Bond Bond get Bond wakes up strapped to a table, being interrogated by two ninjas and um, a Hong Kong narcotics officer. And, and interestingly, one of his own men turns up to try and knock him out because Bond certainly finds out that that you know that he's screwing everything up for the Hong Kong people. Yes, but, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether it's another double uh, O agent or whether it's a liaison. Well, so, um, I always wonder if he could be the head of their, you know, their people in that area. And I think I remember I've seen he was in Ghostbusters too as a a wait as a head waiter in the, <laughs> in the restaurant. That that's a strange point to remember, but I think it probably is him. But yeah, he's going to knock him out basically with pills and uh, with a, a shot. Sorry, and then yes, uh, again swearing because he tells him to piss off when he's asking him where did he get this stuff. This yeah, from, yeah. Uh, who who are you with? Who are you working yeah. for? This belongs to the government. Where? How did you get your hands on this? Yeah, this is this is um, this is government equipment. How did you get your hands on it? It shouldn't be here. Piss off. Very groggy. Which is always fun when they show lessons killed you in the day on television because they cut all the sweary out amongst the other scenes. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are correct. Uh, his uh, the president's father was in. Uh, from Russia with love. Yes. So, but, uh, uh, and then, uh, the, go on. Amandaris, Amandaris Senior. Excellent. But the, the most unlikely saviour for Bond at this point is actually is a Sanchez. a tank. Yeah. Sanchez. <laughs> Hella. Sanchez. A tank. And, uh, yes. <laughs> and, and the not Cuban army. <laughs> And the fact that the uh, the Hong Kong narcotics guy takes cyanide rather than uh, yeah. taking the live. Yeah, and again he tells he tells his his female ninja the same. Don't be taken alive. But I like how it's fortuitous, and mm. it's not just fortuitous in the sense of um, he was going to kill the triad anyway because we didn't actually know that at that point. It's also the fact that it helps Bond with his cover. Because Sanchez now thinks he's on Sanchez's side. Yes. Because he's like, well, they tried to kill him, so clearly he's not here to do anything bad to me because they're trying to stop him. Maybe he is on the level. No, it's it's nice that he's, you start seeing that kind of second-guessing. Mm-hmm. And Bond's lucky enough that he he find you know he he's taken and find and wakes up in Sanchez's mansion. Yes, very interesting decor. Yes, the fish face. Hmm. 
I I I remember I remember when he he wakes up and I'm like yes I'd be I'd be terrified of that too. Yeah, and he's been looking to have all his clothes cleaned and pressed. It's a brand new suit. Ah. It's a it's a brand new suit for him. Because obviously his his other one was tattered. Because despite the male ninja's best efforts of dying on top of Bond, he does get a bit battered up when the house when the house collapses. But he's uh, he manages to get up. You know he goes and has a nice cup of coffee and a, a smoke yeah. with uh, with Sanchez, where Sanchez quizzes him about what's going on. And Bond's smart enough to basically say, "Oh yes, there were people who were." Uh, must have been paid and very well briefed. Yes. He starts feeding because the big thing with Sanchez is he's obsessed by loyalty, and you yeah. see this throughout the film. He's obsessed by people being loyal to him. So Bond sows the seed of doubt in his mind. That's that where it all starts. Yeah, it's it's been started by somebody within his operation. Yeah, and it's um, I do I do like that he's. He he controls his emotions. I any lesser of an actor would show struggle with mm. you know having to be nicey nicey with this guy, knowing what he's done. But Dalton understands that no, I would be a consummate professional because I want this to go right. So I am going to be nice to him and act like the bond that he knows is nothing like the real bond. And so Dalton the idea. Does have a- Don does have a strange accent slip in the scene, though. Yes. Which is where he, he goes very northern with the word nasty. Yes. That, to be fair, I've gathered Tim they don't did spend quite a lot of time in Manchester, so I think he may have grown up in there for a, a, a point in his life. So, yeah, interesting, interesting. But it, the whole way he gets off the, gets off the island is interesting, where he, he, he gets Lupe to help him get off the island and yeah. clings to a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going shopping. Bye. And poor Bond, like that, holding what about on for the dear poor, life. What about the poor person who's there to stop her? God, that's yes. it, that poor man. He's like, please yeah. don't go, please. That that that's probably one of the most realistic portrayals. Is oh, I'm so dead. <laughs> Quite literally, I bet he did get killed. Yeah, that that's the that's the only thing I'm not surprised is you know there wasn't a. Oh, where's he gone? Oh, I dealt with him. You left the island. Oh, I dealt with him. So he's definitely he's definitely a uncredited death. <laughs> and what did you? How did he feel? Because obviously Bond returns to the hotel, thinking that the you know, the dirt has been done to him by Pam, and he goes like psychopath. What did you think of that scene? Because that's a bit of a different thing. You you know he's he's unkempt looking. He's tired. He's he's very Again, stubbly. Having having being shot at, a house fall on him, dragged through the sea. I'm surprised it didn't take. Uh, I'm surprised it took him as long as it did to find her, because I mm. I'd want to know immediately. But again, it it was a nice it was a nice scene of Bond letting. Bond trying to remind everyone why he's here. Because something else yeah. I noticed is he keeps trying to get rid of people. Yeah. Every he opportunity pulled, yeah. he can, he keeps trying to say, like, when they first arrive at the hotel, Bond tries to pay off Pam. And he's like, yes. go, go away, yeah, go away. Yeah. And she refuses. And it's this scene that explains it. And it's the introduction of the Stinger missiles, which is why Hella is still there. Because uh, you would think at this point, Hella's not really needed. Mm. But then you realize he's providing Stinger missiles. And this is where Pam reveals what she knew and what she was giving to Felix. The fact that it was that she provided the Stinger missiles for her freedom, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's and something the deal was lines. gonna go yeah. through until Bond blew the window out, which made Hella turn tail, and he said, "The next time I see you, I'm gonna kill you." Yeah, and Bond's gone like he's going like he's 
controlling his rage and not shooting it because he pulls her, her, her other firearm from her. Uh, <laughs> One of her other know, thigh pistols. A thigh, you know, thigh holster, and he's like holding yeah. her at gunpoint. And he's he realizes there's he, there's more to do, and he can actually still resolve the situation. And as you said, he is he is trying to get rid of people because he loses. I also tells, tells Q to like basically bugger off. Well, he keeps uh, telling because you you're not a field agent. Yes. And it's like I know, but you are, and you need me. I do I do like that element with Q. But the other thing I thought with Pam was, it's Bond's realization of he may have he may have cocked up. Yes. Yes. Because Pam had an out. If he hadn't done what he did, Pam would have been safe. Mm. He could have still gone after Sanchez. Could have still stopped him before Sanchez got hold of the Stinger missiles. And I think it's that realization of by he's realizing how emotional he's getting and how he's not thinking through. And he, you start seeing him take it slightly more like a normal mission. And it, we start slightly getting back to, I'd say, proper Bond, but, you know, mm. we do start getting back to Bond. Well, he has, as they would say, dropped a ricker. Things have gone a bit wrong. So, uh, oh, just a smidge. But, but it's, it's, yeah, because he obviously then, he doesn't, he, yeah, he has to get back. But his his big push is that he started sowing lots of doubt into the mind of of uh, Sanchez, and you yeah, see, well, the setup of Crest, which is which something I else, got, really, isn't it? Yeah, they get onto the fab back on the boat. They've got the money in the um, decompression chamber, the decompression chamber, and obviously, which again ties back to the transaction that failed because again. Sanchez mentions uh, previously in one of the scenes about missing money and mm-hmm. that, you know, Crest is on thin ice and Bond sets this up by returning the money to Crest's decompression chamber. Well, the other thing he's done is he's getting Lupe is there to try and be a witness or Crest would hope she's a witness. And she's like, oh, I know nothing. I, need, I know none of this. Yes. You know, I don't remember his face. I don't remember anything about it. Well, he does. He, he, he doesn't suggest she knows anything. She's going like, you know. So you tell me this guy flew well like a bird. And yes. Obviously, they find the the you know the the whole the distraction money. thing of having yeah. Pam pretending to be the harbour pilot and crashing to the harbour and all these yeah. things going on. And when the money's found, Sanchez goes completely ape, throws. Kill the uh, yeah, sorry, throws Crest into the decompression chamber and then basically cranks the pressure up. In, um, cranks the pressure and then cuts the valve, yeah, which uh, makes... venting it immediately so that the equalization in pressure um, results in explosive decompression of Crest. It's and like this... a popping pea, a scene that most of the time was kind of really cut down because his head well, just goes boom. Yeah, and but as I was saying, this is th- this is the scene that I mentioned uh, at the start of the podcast. It's one of the few scenes where an aging effect still works. Like if you freeze it on the frame of his head inflating, yes, it does look a bit rubbery. But by viewing it solely through the porthole, which then gets splattered in blood. It preserves the effect much more so than having a camera inside the chamber and seeing a body explode. And again, you've it, got to think, if you were watching this at the time, this is not what you would expect from Bond at all. Well, you wouldn't have ever seen this with Roger Moore's style of Bond, would you? People's heads going pop. Not this bloodily. I mean, you'd have... Um, you'd have Karanga. Uh, yeah, Karanga, you know, uh, Mr. Big going boom, but not like he's bit no. flying everywhere. Again, he, when when Karanga explodes, it looks like a sofa's been blown up. <laughs> yeah, it like, does. It's, it's weird. <laughs> it's just bits of fabric and what looks like foam. Like, there's, as you said, there's no blood, whereas, but in this one, it's, you know, it's only a flash against the port, the porthole, but it's enough to show it to you. And the noise. The noise of it, well, 
But, uh, I mean, you get the la- – now, this ties in perfectly to what you said earlier, which is the comedy lines are not going to bond so much. No. You know, it's the people around him because they're saying, Pedro, what about the money? And the line of, you know, launder it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a double entendre and it's comedy. Yeah. And I was uh, – that was, again, it's just like, that's cold. Yeah. That was – like <laughs> you know, but it's it, – as you say, it is the better – it is the better idea of, you know, being more, being more realistic. Like, yeah, 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 you do have to be slightly mad to make a joke after killing someone. And it's the the fact that obviously, you know, Bond basically tells uh, Pam, he tells Q, right, you're done, go home, it's over, it's me on my own now. He manages to somehow get back to Sanchez. Yes, I was going to say that scene where he somehow. Like, it, it's like, it, well, it's not just that as well. It's it's like um, the kid who's been caught out of bed. Yes, totally, yeah. Cause... <laughs> he's, 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 he's under the covers and he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, what? Hmm? No, he's I've been still, asleep all night. Yeah, And, and then, he's taken his shirt off, but he's kept but when his Sanchez trousers leaves, on. Yeah. He, t- he gets out of the bed and he realizes he's just dressed from the waist down. But again, it's also interesting that when you look at him in this film, He's, you know, he's got like scars yes. on his body, which you didn't really see with Bond much. No. But yeah, um, again, you get the, um, you get that wonderful, the, and again, a wonderful, an, another good scene of sowing the doubts of it's like, you know, Bond, Bond lays the groundwork for, you know, the only, the one, just the one. Do you yeah. know what I mean? He's oh like, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. When he's just like, "Are you sure you've got them all?" Because again, he's trying to destroy as much as he can. So that gets that gets supplanted, and then Sanchez invites him on the tour with the triad. And I can kind of see you might think, "Well, why would he do that?" But he's obviously seen Bond as quite a useful person. Well, again, it's mentioned um, further on. Uh, previously, when Bond first wakes up in Sanchez's place, Hella goes, you won't believe what I found out about this guy. Oh, God, yeah. Cause he fa- yes, yeah. And Sanchez he goes, admits- he's a British agent. Yeah, because Bond's, you know a, that? Bond's I fed know him things. a bit of information. Well, yeah, yeah. And he, f- and he fed him the truth. I'm a former British agent. Which, again, if Hella was to check his contacts, that's what would come up, because he's resigned. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So he tells the truth, and Sanchez bites. So he, it's 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 that inner circle moment of, you've shown that I can trust you, even though you've manipulated me for the entire film. I'm sorry, but when he said the truth, all I can think of is that scene in The Simpsons when Marge is he's selling houses, real estate, and uh, Linus well, when goes, there's the happened- truth. Lionel's going, there's the truth and the truth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's the truth. Not yeah, the truth. That's the one, the, the nodding. Truth. <laughs> the Shame. murder house. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then, unfortunately, uh, we get the love triangle moment where Lupe spends the night with Bond. But within that, I do like the fact that Lupe, when he's saying, we'll make sure you get home, and Lupe present real a uh, realistic portrayal and she says i spent years trying to get away from that i don't want to go back <laughs> it's like, yeah i don't want to go yeah. back to that place it was a shithole <laughs> yeah yeah look listen he's a psychopath but at least he got me out of there <laughs> how bad must there have been <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i'm willing to take on a psychotic murderer because home's worse fair enough and then, of course, she goes and snitches to Pam and Q in the morning. <laughs> I love that scene. <laughs> Just knocks on the door. Pam thinks it's Bond. Uh, it's it's the it's the impre- it's the snarky impression that Pam does well, when Lupe it's... leaves. Oh, I love James. Yeah, but it's also the way she kind of like oddly, like I don't know the way either. It's what um, Talisa Soto is wearing. But she kind of like it's an, she got like an odd kind of walk into the room, like a, a kind of stumble bounce. But it's like this thing when she's smoking, she going, you know, Pam's going, I haven't had one of these in five years, and that comment of you know when she's saying oh. I was with Bond last night, I love him, etc. The usual 
kind of thing you'd expect. Yeah. And he's like, you know, she's upset and he's going, you know, he must use everything at his disposal. He was just stunned. Yeah. He was yeah. just stunned there going, yeah. I don't know. I'm not normally here for this bit. <laughs> yeah. I don't he know does roll his do. eyes. But it's yeah. where he's like, she's like, just the bullshit line. <laughs> yeah. And as I said, it's just like, how dare you speak to Desmond Llewellyn like that? Man but as it moves hero. on, yeah, as it moves on, it's quite interesting. So again, you know, Bond's at the old, uh, the where they're the showing about the mixture of gasoline and drugs with the triad people, oh, and well, he's. You jumping ahead? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a ter- I'm a bad man. Go on. Once what have again, I done? you're forgetting another brilliant scene. Oh, you, oh yes, his mustache and his <laughs> broom. His weird radio broom. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. The giving, to be fair, it's as what did Desmond Land say? It's the most fun he's ever had. Cause it's the most they've ever given him to yes. do. He's getting to yeah. travel because he's just he, and it's because it's a scene of on the way to the compound, which doubles up as the um, evangelic evangelic the televangelists cult, which, which really worried me because I got massive Waco vibes. Mm. The, well, that could be yeah. Which it could be intentional, it could not be, because it would have been in the news at that point. Even but Waco was ninety four, this was ni- eighty nine. But yeah. there, there's a lot of cults around that era. There are. There's uh, Boko Asahara who did the SARS attack on the Japanese train system. There's um, there's an Indian guru who set up a cult in I think Oregon. And try to run for like mayor and poisoned people with weaponized salmonella. So, right. it, you know, in the news, there were those kind of things. But yeah, just Q and his disguises and then being thrown, it, fa- throw, throwing it into the head yeah, as well yeah. afterwards and walking off. But it's also interesting. So, again, you see the, and I'm glad you reminded me that, or I would have glossed over these, the fact that you see again Sanchez's, you know, sweep of power because. Pam's you know, Pam plane. tries to get a plane. Yes. And he's like, no, it's you know, plane. Senor, San, yeah, Senor Sanchez says, did, 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 whatever he's must be done. He's a full service. It's, yeah, it's been stripped so or whatever. It's yeah. been dismantled and she steals the crop duster that's just been left <laughs> running handily just behind her over the shoulder in the shot. Mm. But yeah, I did like the, um, I also like the fact that um, Del Toro returns. Yes, that's true. That's true. For the final reveal. Because Del Toro recognises Bond from the bar. But yeah, I do and I like... Think he, I think he recognises him even... He recognises him with the mask on. Him. Yeah, I was going to say yes. his eyes. He must recognise his eyes, yeah. What he does is, when they're doing the experiment, showing the triad how the petrol can be distilled back into what is essentially cocaine sludge, mm. and then... I'm guessing they'll dry it out. Um, Del Toro has a knife in Bond's back. Yeah, because he, he kind of says, who's the new guy, doesn't he? And yeah, because Del Toro is questioning Sanchez, and it's like, Sanchez is like, oh, he's a, he's not useful. a... Yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a useful man, or something like that. And then, obviously, um, whilst this is happening, Pam is flirting obnoxiously. With the televangelist and his own Professor Joe, Professor played by Wayne Newton. Yeah, who does before really... Wayne Newton looked like a melted candle. Yeah, and I think he does. I think he does a fun job. Oh, I think he's very good in it. Yeah, I like him. Yeah. And he takes it takes her into his sex dungeon, <laughs> as I like to call it. Because <laughs> it is that's that's what that is. Come soundproofed. On. Yeah, soundproof <laughs> sex dungeon. And she, again, legs to die for, puts them to excellent use. Mm. And then, yeah, as I say, um, Bond strikes in, in the science lab by headbutting Del Toro and then throwing a burning chemical because <laughs> they're explaining yeah. how the petrol is still petrol. So he, yeah. he ignites the petrol that's in the beaker. The bomb just picks it up and hurls it, and it starts in massive fire. Well, they always say, don't they? They, they kind of make a joke about Dalton being the headbutting bond because he yes. does it in Living Daylight and this one. But it, and it's also again it's a one very of his go-to cool, moves. 
Yeah, a very cool scene in the way they deal with him, which is he gets beaten up, but then gets basically his hands tied and put onto a conveyor belt to a like yes. a machine that's going to sight, you know, cut through the cocaine. Yeah, it's a two cylindrical grinders that powder the cocaine. They just literally throw the blocks of cocaine in, and it just processes them. And it's the fact that Bond is still playing Sanchez. Yeah, he is. Yeah. At this point, he is still trying to point out things like, what well, you know, where's Hella? Mm, who's got your money? Who's got your money? Because again, they have a. He has a. Um, an exter- he has an external accountant, as it were. He has Truman a double-barreled Lodge. name. Yeah, Truman Lodge. Truman Lodge. Truman Lodge has got your money. Hella's got your missiles. You've got nothing. And it works. Well, the only thing they get, because nothing gets his Sanchez's attention until the mention of Stinger missiles. Yeah. And that's when Sanchez runs off and actually finds out Hella is. Because he gets caught. Yes. And San- also- Sanchez, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say it's also you're right. It cuts to the fact that he's dealing with uh with with um with Heller, but it's also going from that scene. So you got he finds him, and clearly you know things are going to get bad for Heller. But it's also the scene of where uh, Dario is going to kill Bond, which is you know just a brilliant scene, and uh, you know Bond's hanging by. He's clearly he never seen a Bond film before. No. <laughs> but he's hanging I'm on, s- isn't he? Because like, he's been it's, snagged. Yeah, he's snagged with his own binds. But it's the fact that the building is still burning down. And Del Toro still commits the second worst thing a, a villain can do besides monologuing, which is moving in for the kill. Mm. And fun fact, he actually cut Timothy Dalton during that scene, and he, he still did. has the scars he, on his wrists. Yeah, he did, yeah. I was about to say that myself. He beat me too. He cut him. Ah. But it's very, it's very cool how um, Pam appears and tries. How I, I don't really understand how she misses him, or if she does shoot him and only like wings him. Because his response is, you're dead. Because he's like, kind of last year, you're dead. And she appears a bit heavenly in her robes that she's stolen. Yes. Because he obviously is supposed to think he's already killed her. I can only think, I can only think it's, it is a distraction of, you know, it's almost like Emil in RoboCop. Yes. You're dead. Yes. <laughs> we killed you. Yeah. yeah. It, so it is that element of she, she misses him because she's expecting him to move. Therefore, mm-hmm. she's preempting his mo- his movement. But yeah, him getting thrown into the grinder, and the scene from below the grinder. Oh God, yeah. But again, if you actually watch it, it's just blood. There's no chunks or anything like that. Yeah. So it's obvious that the grinder is not on the same set. But and I do fact- like the I do like the response from Bond, which almost has a when you think about it, it's a slight almost comedy element when she's Switch like, "Switch the you bloody okay? machine off." Yeah, quite literally, the, yes. but also a bloody machine. Yes. Switch the bloody machine off. And but it's like- uh, yeah, and and they then have to escape, but uh, we do at least get the one Bond quip. Yes, and it's really bad. <laughs> it's it like it, yeah. So unfortunately, Hella has been impaled on the forks of a forklift, which then drives through the wall, which provides Bond and Pam with an exit because they are trapped. And Bond um, looks like Hella found a dead end. Yeah, and I was yeah. like. Come on, Tim. Yeah. I, I bet he said uh, that one. I bet he was like rolling his eyes internally saying that. Yeah. I'd have, I'd have gone with something more like, well, I guess he forked up. <laughs> Again, at least at least that makes sense. At least it's connected. It's still oh, as well, bad. But it's well, you'd really re- reuse the Thunderball line about you got the point. Yeah, I think you got the point in that one. But yeah, so... I like how we're now into the final action scene and uh, <laughs> Pam robs the professor at 
no. as, they, as yeah. they drive past in the golf cart. And he's just like, God bless you. But it's, uh, yeah, and then obviously they're in the plane and it comes to, because Sanchez, um, well, he's initially in the car, isn't he? In his Maserati. He, with yes, all he's, in, in, it. he's yeah. in the Maserati by Turbo. <laughs> he I'm is impressed in, you know. Yeah, well, I w- I've been watching the Grand Tour recently, so. <laughs> but yeah, he's in he's in he's in a very nice Maserati, and Bond and Pam drop onto the convoy. So it's four mm-hmm. trailer tankers full of cocaine, petrol, and a couple of henchmen cars. And Bond drops onto the last one. Um, Sanchez apparently is an awful shot. But he can play the James Bond theme with the bullets. Yes, that was a lovely little touch. <laughs> I it was it's one of those things of the hidden Bond theme. Ding ding da ding. <laughs> so that that was good. And then we get into the proper the proper chases and the, again the glorious physical stunts. Mm. I mean, going looking at the behind the scenes stuff for the tankers. I did start getting flashbacks to Fast and Furious going or, fl- or flash forward. Yeah, it's like, ah, I see where their their influence comes from, but at least this is competent. And then it also shows that it sucks to be a uh, you know, Sanchez accountant after he's he, Oh god, like, loses cuz Truman he loses. loses his shit. He goes mad, does he? He's going great, another million dollar right off. Yeah. Five, no, whatever it is. Yeah, he's like we've lost so much because at that point, um, Bond has destroyed one tanker via Stinger missile. So he yes, runs it off I... the road initially. Yeah. And then one of the henchmen grabs one of the Stinger missiles, fires it at Bond. And the French stuntman who was on set did the almost unbelievable. Like they genuinely didn't think this was even possible. He actually tilted the truck on two wheels. Wow. Originally, yes. yeah. there there was a truck. It's the last surviving truck as well. That that truck was set up with a fifth wheel that was hidden in the sleeper bed. So from the way it's filmed, uh, the under the underside of the truck would have been to the camera. So we see the underside, not the not the far side. So that an arm would have swung out and supported the truck at a forty five degree angle. Mm-hmm. And the idea was they just run it along the rig with the with the extra stabilizer wheel, as it were. And they didn't need to. This guy just went, that's, nah, that's I can do it. And he just hits. He hits that. And it's, uh, if you watch some of the back behind the scenes featurettes, they're like, we didn't even think he could do it with just the cab. And he not wow. only did he do it with the cab, he did it with the cab and the trailer. And then that's and then he dumps back on all four wheels on top of one of the henchmen's jeeps and flattens it. The only really strange scene with that is that the, and obviously it's done for the film, is that the the uh, henchmen wait an awfully long time to fire the uh, rocket off. Well, I, I do <laughs> I do agree in the sense of it, it is a long time, but it's also the fact of, if I remember my um, firearms correctly, the Stinger is... Um, it's it's not a guided missile, but I think they're trying to make it sound like one. Right. So it needs time to to lock onto a signature, which would make no sense as to why it then misses, as if it's flying right. like a standard right. missile. Right. But either way, it's it's for the purpose of a very very beautiful stunt. It's a very and good it, stunt. It really it's just it's fantastic. It makes me smile every time. And then we get the slightly weirder stunt, which I tried looking up about this. There's not a lot of information on it, but Bond does a wheelie in a truck. Yeah. Mm. I'm not, because I think that, must, that has to be an alteration to the vehicle to be able to abso- do Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, from my understanding, again, it's there's no photographs or anything like that. It's all hearsay, but the frame was cut in half. And there's a counterweight at the back of the truck and the cab, the sleeper section of the cab at the back was fitted 
with a hydraulic system. Mm-hmm. So the counterweight would hold the equivalent of the front end of the truck, and it would also be driven from the rear because you never see the back of the truck until That's it's true. a cut shot. So as they're driving it through the flames, my understanding was all the controls were behind the truck. The cab mm-hmm. is empty, but the engine's still up there because you see the drive shafts turning. Hmm. Interesting. The other thing I've, I've also seen as the option is it also looks like only the rear wheels are being driven out of out of the six wheels on the truck. So it could have also been that they set it up where it's essentially a car with front wheel hmm. drive with the front of a truck welded on it could, that's got nothing yeah. in it. I can believe like a bare that. bones truck so that they lift the front end up the back wheels which are actually the front wheels of the former car are then pushing it through like it it, it will have been a custom built rig but th- mm-hmm. that one does get me a little bit because it's just like i know trucks can't bend there otherwise we'd have a lot more accidents but it's also bond does a very roger moore thing go on so as, as he's driving through this fire he winds the window up, <laughs> which is very, <laughs> it's very Roger Moore, that one, where he's just like cranking the window up as fire comes past him. Maybe he's worried about his suit getting singed. But it's, uh, I think, I mean, I like the fact that obviously they take, you know, these machine guns at the window uh, of the truck, which he then has to kick out. But it, I like the fact he uses cruise control effectively. Yeah, I, <laughs> well, I do and I don't on that sense. Because you see it going off road, but just trundling along because it's important for the final scene. Yeah, but obviously you use it just but so you all can the get other close ones, and grab yeah. on to the other one, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah, but all the other ones have been uh, like rolled over and exploded. But I do like um, how Bond dispatches one of the trailers as well. He um, when he does the two wheeled stunt, as it were, mm-hmm. he's got the ch- truck on its side. The trailer gets shot at and loses tires and it jackknifes and it's a long winding road and the trucks are below mm-hmm. Bond. So he disconnects the trailer just at the right time. That's true. Yeah. Which yeah, then he hits one of the other tankers, which then that's why um, that's why the accountant flips out because he's like, right, we've lost three, t- three tankers. Now we have one left. And Sanchez responds by riddling him with bullets. Yeah, with a great line of cutting overhead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We've got to start cutting overheads. Uh, excellent suggestion. It takes his bonds, isn't it? Yeah, bonds. He's got in a, a, his briefcase. But it's I like the fact that when it comes to the fight scene, because obviously bonds now on the back of the tank and he cuts the yes. what the the brake lines. Uh, well, sorry, no, he's fighting Sanchez, oh, and Sanchez, Sanchez yeah. cuts the brake line, doesn't he? Because he goes in yes. with his machete. Well, Sanchez, the driver slams on the brakes. Bond falls between the tanker and the truck. That's the one. Which is what triggers Sanchez. He gets out, goes ham with the machete and cuts the airline. Now, unfortunately, again, a bit of a blooper. Um, I only discovered this from researching the trucks. If you cut the brake line, if you cut the airline on a truck, it jams the brakes on. I was just saying, does it lock up? Yeah. It locks them up, not the other way around. So it's a little bit of a blue bubble. Again, it it is a good little extra. Th- it's, it's a nice added um, danger to the final fight. And it's Sanchez. one hell of a final fight, isn't it? You, again, when I was talking about this change to brutal and almost realism. Yes. Where they cling on to the back of the uh the the um the, you know, the petrol container section fighting as it goes over the edge and yeah that everywhere. roll that roll is yeah because uh, again Bond on Bond opens the trailer yeah he takes the rear tap off yeah yeah like that's so it's dumping fuel as it's going so even if he doesn't destroy it the money's gone because it's all in yeah, soaked fuel up and the, coke going everywhere so yeah soaked up in the soaked up and yeah. The tanker rolls over. Really, it should be end credits at this point because no one's surviving that. But <laughs> again, like you said, the added realism, Bond is crawling. Oh, he's 
battered. Yeah, and he's like groaning and, and yeah, he's not in good shape. And somehow Sanchez, I think, fueled by anger and Sanchez adrenaline. Sanchez comes, out, but at that point, Sanchez looks the best. He doesn't look as battered. Bond's like soup shredded in parts. He's covered in yeah. blood. He's got nosebleed. He's like, oh, Sanchez. Uh, is, uh, uh. Sanchez is soaked. <laughs> That's true. And then, of course, we get the fantastic Chekhov's gun ending of the lighter making a return and being the final weapon of getting the revenge of igniting Sanchez. Well, it's the way which... Bond asks a preological question because the, the Sanchez obviously did think something of him because he says to him, you know, you could have had everything. And he was worried about to chop his head off and he's saying, well, don't you want to know why? And that's how he when well, he sets him on fire. But it's an interesting yeah. point that Sanchez must have really thought something of Bond and thought he could have been his right hand man. Um, and like, yeah, yeah cause, and then the fire at that ball, point, at that point, Bond has Bond has shown no motivation. Well, there's, there's no logic. Can you imagine some guy's yeah. just on haywire and been offing people left, right, and centre. You're like, why is he doing this? <laughs> and it, it's not even the fact that Sanchez has a sudden awakening moment either of. You know, like a final realization of it was you all along. Mm. Yeah, there is none of that. <laughs> there isn't one. No, he's just like, no, I'm not even going to give you the satisfaction. Flambe. Yeah, I mean, do you think? I know we see an up close of the, you know, two Bond to James Love Della and Felix, or Felix and Della on the lighter. Do you think he could Sanchez could see that, or do you think he just ignites him? I think he just ignites him because yeah, I, thought that. Yeah. I also th- I'm also certain that's a reused shot. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's the same shot from the wedding. Yeah. So I don't think I don't think Sanchez even gets the answer, which, again, would make sense for this. In yeah, the, yeah. In the idea of Bond's motivation, he doesn't even give Sanchez the satisfaction. And what I it, mean, that, because it doesn't matter. Yeah, it that makes matter. more sense. Yeah, I didn't. I uh, when I first saw it when I was younger, I thought we well, must see the light. I thought I thought he did, at least in a like yeah. a flash, but there's no way that Bond can hold it in such a way where yeah, he can still ignite it. it, and Sanchez can read it. Now, if he had a second lighter, yeah, yeah, or a gadget, then we could have done that. He could have thrown in the lighter, let him read it as a distraction. And then hits him with another one. No, I think you're right. He just sets him on fire. And it was, I think at the time, wasn't it like one of the longest burns he did or something for the um, guy who's in the, the costume? The, you I know, the, the stunt man. I don't think so, because I think that got beaten. Um, well, at the time it could have been. But I, I do know the the two tanker explosions that look like Michael Bay's wet dreams. <laughs> <coughs> Those are real. Those are not miniatures. They are genuine tankers full of gasoline just blown up. Because I know when they were blown, when they had the fire thing, I think, I'm sure, I don't know if it was Timothy Dawn said it, or they said about when they filmed it, he had to like really run away from stuff that was on fire. Yeah, because there was an element of, um, it's a real highway. It's a real disused highway. Uh, supposedly haunted. Oh, the hand, well. the hand. Yeah, yeah, the, the flaming hand. <laughs> well, it's, Again, it's a, it's the fact that the the road is actually supposed to be haunted in Mexico. A number of drivers have died. That's why they closed it off. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, again, a lot of practical effects. The, there's a fantastic shot of it looks like a flaming jeep driving over off a cliff and over Pam's plane. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But I suspect perspective is a cameraman's best friend. It's key. Yeah, yeah. But again, it's is a it's a look it's a fantastic shot because it cuts to a close-up of pam like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> and but again pam's crash landing is a bit it's it's i find it a little bit funny like she gets blowback from a stinger missile from three <laughs> feet away yeah because there's like it blows a Sanchez hole Sanchez uses the last it? yeah yeah he, he uses the last stinger missile misses but somehow damages the tail on the plane which then crash lands into the desert and gets both of its wings hacked off as it Mm. flies through a little ravine 
and then Handley parks itself right next to Bond's truck that was on cruise control. So it's Pam true. to the re- so Pam to the rescue at the end. But I love that scene, as she said, when she goes to cause she, you know, does the horn thing and says like, you know, get in. But aren't you going to ask me? But it's that. But I'm telling you, May, for that, that that scene there with the truck, the scene when you see Bond sat on the rock. Yes, I think that's, that's really good. Cause he looks tired. He looks beaten down. Yeah. Maybe one of these. This it is this one. Well, it, again, it's over. What do I do now? Yeah, that's yeah. Shit. What do I do now? <laughs> like, I've done what I, I've done what I set out to do. Now what? Yeah. Where and do then, I go? Yeah, and then he goes. So oh, he goes oh. back. Go on. Sorry. We can imagine him thinking, oh, my God, my wallet's just gone up. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> my Amex card. I le- oh, God, I left the hotel key in the third truck. Shit. <laughs> so, yeah, I, it is. But it is not. As you say, it's 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 nice to see that kind of experimental bond that yes, yeah. we now know yeah. as a standard. Yeah. Although yeah, I think true, now but, it's been yeah. pushed too far. No, I'd agree. It is because. Like. It has gone too far, but we do for the first time. We kind of see Bond. He's resigned. He's battered. He looks human rather mm. than this Teflon uh, action hero. And it then cuts to, and people do complain about this. Bond. He's a he's back at well, what what was Sanchez's place, and he's yes. on the telephone to Felix and talking to him, and he's saying, you know, I'll come and see you. Um, and he said, I think you might want to speak. You know, I think M might have a job for you. I think M wants, wants, to, M wants to speak. I think he might have a M job might want to sp- I think M wants to speak to you first. Yeah. But he's Something saying, like uh, people complain saying that Felix seems too happy. But he's probably, in a sense, happy that at least he's alive and his friend's alive. Yeah. And there is a scene in the novelization where Bond says to him something on the lines of, I know it's difficult, but it, like, it gets better. He's obviously alluding to the loss of his friend. Yeah. Of course, he's going to. I have to admit, but again, I, I can, in my head, I can justify it with, he's probably off his noggin on drugs. Yeah, he's probably, he's yeah. he's he's on the moon with painkillers because it's post surgery, post amputation. Mm-hmm. So I just I write off his joviality as it's the drugs. Yes, but it is a little jarring, and it should be like. It should be slightly sombre, but mm. like, thank you, James. Yeah. It won't yeah. bring her back, but at least, yeah. you know, you know, at least we know it, it'll never happen to anyone else. You know, that would have been a better scene. It does. It does go a bit, as I said, it's slightly improving the novelization with that. Well, there's like a, a, a comment upon that, mm. uh, about the loss of his wife. And it's very interesting how we then see. Obviously, Lupe is trying to get Bond to stay with her, the kiss, and then obviously Pam <coughs> catches them. He's upset. Um, Q again notices this. He's like, for God's sake, I think. Um, yeah, because Pam hands Pam hands Q his drink, her drink. Yes. Yes. So he's stuck with two drinks, or is it? No, I think. Um, well, he does. They have drinks. Bond he's hands going, here's to you. Yeah, he's going, yeah. Here's to you, she, here's to you, my dear. And then they see it unfolding, and she runs off upset. But um, there's obviously the, the 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 comment about the iguana, which yes was a pet of Sanchez's, which is hated by Lupe. But she said, you know, yeah, it, apparently on friend. set. Apparently on set, it, the lizard hated her. No, oh. um, like it never worked on, never worked well on the scenes, but loved. Robert. <laughs> interesting. Well, Love Sanchez is the actor. Interesting, interesting. But it's uh, she obviously gets what was the iguana's like necklace is now her diamond, uh, you know. Which to me made no sense because it's like yeah, all that stuff's getting seized. <laughs> this well, is this, I don't know. this is a Maybe third world. Well, it's no, it's a third world back hole. There's yeah. going to be there's going to be a power vacuum, and the next big drug lord. You're going to move in by just taking over the territory, including the house and everything in it. But I do find it interesting how Lupe's trying to get Bond to stay with her. And he says, oh, I think you and El Presidente will make the perfect couple. And then jumps like, off know, a wall. Jumps. Yeah. Somehow doesn't manage to like paralyze himself, but lands in a swimming pool. I, I, that would have been hilarious if there was no pool. 
Oh my he'd ma- god. He'd missed, he'd missed, and la- missed and landed on the patio with a shattered pelvis. Q! Yeah. I knew it will, Chip! It would be rather like, you know, that scene in what was it, the uh, cable guy, man down, possible back injury. Yeah. But uh, yeah, he then pulls uh, Pam, pulls into, Pam the into the water. Bo- yeah. yeah. And they have the, you know, the, the re- a repeat of the, you no, know, what's it, you're going to, why don't you wait till you asked? Yeah, I, uh, it doesn't work for me that. It's just yeah, like. Why don't you ask me? And they kiss. Yeah. The, the, the thing that is really weird, and I don't too, mind that too much as any, but why do we get the winking fish? Because. <laughs> I, I'm just assuming it's the implication of the cocaine has gotten into the water and now everyone's high. <laughs> Why else would Bond ju- vault over a wall into a swimming pool two stories below him? But as, a, as the, I mean, that as the film goes, I like, I do, I didn't used to like it as much as I do now when I've managed to reappraise it. And I think it's a good film and I think it's set a good template for what would happen but at the time it wasn't a huge success because i suspect it wasn't as maybe a bit too realistic maybe not as polished as people would want you know I think, too too violent the, yeah i think the problem is it's it's too much too soon compared to the living daylights mm-hmm. because again the living daylights is a what what you could call a more true to formula film yeah yeah um so again it's got the it's got the jokes. It's got, as you say, the subverted violence. Um, everything's got a slightly more comedic twist. Like even the car chase when in the Living Daylights, Bond flies into the ski the ski shed, and it's you know he's he's driving a shed round a <laughs> round a frozen <laughs> pond, round a frozen lake. You know, so again, that's slightly humorous. The way he cuts the larder off at the wheels. Again, those elements are completely absent from this. Mm. And yeah. as I say, I think the huge cut in the budget can That's be seen true. in the fact that, again, we're not globe trotting around the world. There's only the final scene is the big blockbuster stunt, really. That and the opening. Mm-hmm. The middle is kind of like it's mostly fist fights that end in escape. Mm. You know, with the, with the exception of the water skiing onto the pontoon plane, but then the plane lands fine. Like, there's no real big set pieces kind of thing until the end with the trucks. So yeah, I think I I, mean, I agree with you. It's not an awful film. It's a good film. I like. But I can understand what they were aiming for, but it's certainly a sour note to finish on for it is Timothy Dalton. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, like, what would you give it out of ten? Uh, oh, I'd probably say. Oh, see, I don't want to upset you because I've enjoyed <laughs> myself, and I don't want this to be my first and only celluloid. So you go first, and then I'll tell you. Um, because we've got a good one lined up for the next one. I'll probably give it an eight, to be honest. <laughs> Seven to an eight out of ten. Um. Yeah, I'm glad you went first because I'm giving it a five. Oh, well, it's, nobody's fair enough. Give it whatever. I mean, people can give it whatever they no. want. No, again, it's it's one of those things that for me, I like the old Bonds where it's slightly mm. campy. But I also understand that the older films do have their issues. Mm. I mean, rewatching them now, you do see them with, you, you know, the rose tinted glasses do fall away slightly. Um, and again, you you could compare this to Jason Bourne mm. or any of the other more modern, slightly grittier spy films. It probably it was just ahead. I think it was just ahead of its time, and unfortunately, it just proved wrong wrong place, wrong time. And, and this for a be film, made, yeah, for a film to end your tenure as Bond, it's a hell of a lot better than watching Die Another Day or No Time to Die, in my humble opinion. Uh, I am in complete agreement with you. Uh, <laughs> Dying Die Another Day was a big letdown for me, as, again, Pierce Brosnan is my Bond. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, GoldenEye is such a fantastic... Like, that is a... That's a Agreed. 9 out of 10 yeah. for me. GoldenEye is returned to form, yet at the same time. Fantastic villain. 
um, fantastic set pieces. Bond gets the shit beat out of him and yeah. shows it. And yet it still retains the charm of old Bond. Like everyone's, you know, it had that, it had that glimmer of, you know, slight quippiness, but not so much. You know, Bond, Bond does a, a 360 degree spin in the tank and adjusts his tie before continuing the chase. I like that. Yeah. But as I say, I just think it was, it probably would have done better as a standalone. Mm. But I mean, there's no way to really different. do that. It could have been very different because I think if he said, like, just on the wardrobe alone at one stage, we were trying to get Dalton to wear pastels, and he was like, no, Bond would not wear, you know, because it was Mammy Vice style. Because Bond, you know, wouldn't wear pastels. Um, Bond does not wear pink with a white suit. No. Yeah, wouldn't happen. Um, it would have been a bit too think, Tony Montana for me as well. Yeah. Again, reference yeah, to Scarface, it's just a bit, yeah. it's out of character. As a film, I think it does well. And it's it's an interesting comment that Dalton, when all the legal wranglings had been resolved and, you know, they came back to him and said, right, let's make another one. He basically said, well, we'll do one more. Like, take all the good stuff from the other two and make one more. And Broccoli was like, well, you can't do it that way. You've got to sign up to X amount. And he said, well, that's going to take me into whatever age you'll be, how much time in my life I'll pass. Yeah. Because how old was he when he when he made this? Uh, well, he was 41 when he made Living Daylight. So he'd be, what, 42, 43, maybe around that so, age? Well, uh, Living Daylights was 84, wasn't it? 87. 87. So, yeah, and this was 89. So yeah, he'd be around so, like 42, 43. Which again, Pierce Brosnan went till he was what fifty five, something so, like that. Die another day. So it's it, it's he wouldn't have been the oldest Bond. No. But I I do understand his point of you know how long can I keep it up kind of thing. And it's a, and it, and it's also I guess a big chunk of your life. And if you want to do other things, you know, because the, yeah. the time when everything was getting ready for the next Bond, he was playing Rhett Butler, so he was doing mm. the, uh, the Scarlet thing. So. Obviously, you want to try other stuff. So, but again, it's like there's a book that's come out talking about the potential for the other films that could have come come afterwards. And I'm kind of grateful in a sense we only got the two because it's a bit like I always feel that if you've made you you the what if can be a lot worse than the well we haven't got it. The real well, you know, it's better to just have it's better to have the idea than see yeah, it ruined in the reality. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up with a no time to die. Yeah. And on that bombshell, I think we've definitely been talking enough solo codswap because Gemma will kill us on the length of time this is. So I think this could end up being a twofer. Well, I'm <laughs> sorry, but the film is two hours and 15 minutes. And we've only gone two and a half, you know, nearly. Well, we've only gone 45 minutes over. I think yeah. that's appropriate. Yeah, I, I it's agree. It's a long but, film. I agree. I think but, we should, Gem Hulk, you know, the anger. I know, I know, but still. <laughs> well, if she, if she says anything, next week we'll be doing Lord of the Rings, Fellowship <laughs> of the Ring, the Blu-ray edition, which is four <laughs> hours long. Yeah, so it's like a, we're going to do ten hours. <laughs> easy, easy. With two hours, with two hours of car corner tagged on the end. Yeah, because, you know, there's that truck that goes past in the wide shot. Well, it has been a pleasure, James. I'm... Very, very always is my friend. Always is that you discuss this. So, as I said, we've been telling us Celloid Coswell. I've been James. I've also been James. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>